I had told the techs that the Velcro that was holding the secret compartment that had a, a recorder in it, it's a heavy recorder. And sure enough, the Nagra falls out of the secret compartment oh, into the man. briefcase with a nest of wires. And I'm trying to put this thing together without looking like I'm putting <laughs> something together. He begins to get impatient. He stands up and comes around. I had maybe two seconds. He's sitting there and he's looking at these guys and he's going, they're gringos. So he ran out of the place and get, jumped in a cab and then it was a chase all over Manhattan. China, because they have a capital restriction outside the borders of the People's Republic, but they want to go to the black market. How long does it take to launder a hundred million dollars? Thank you for doing the show today. I know at some level, media is obviously somewhat dangerous for you, at, 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 I guess at some level. So I appreciate the trust first and foremost. Well, thanks. Yeah, yeah it, it, there there is a little bit of a, a security risk because, um, you know, I've, I've continued, especially now that, you know, there's a second book and we're working on a second movie. Um, a lot of uh, it's like taking a, a scab off of an old wound. You know, there's some people who aren't very happy with me. Not only that, but I I wasn't going to jump into the, that part so quick. But yeah, you've you've been a part of some movies about this. I mean, one with Brian Cranston, The Infiltrator, which like you can't really can't really beat that. I mean, he's an awesome actor. I hope you got to meet him. And oh, very much, very much so. Yeah, but now there's a second movie. So you're like you said, you're you're picking at the scab off the the old wound for the cartel guys that you busted. But also, when you're filming a movie and doing meetings and stuff. There's like 40 people in a room and you got calendar invites and it's like, we're going to be at this restaurant having a party. And it's like, that's kind of the opposite of showing up remotely on a podcast from a darkened room where no one can see your face. Right. That is lots of people know when and where you are going to be with tons of advance notice. And that's like not ideal. Well, a lot of them didn't know that I was actually going to be on set. So, um, you know, we, we kind of kept that uh, a little quiet, but, uh, and some of our, uh, it's amazing what they can do with when they're making films. What a lot of our shoots that were shown to be allegedly in New York and parts of the Northeast were actually shot in in London, uh, outside of London, at a place that used to be a a, a factory uh, making nuclear weapons, and um, <laughs> <Okay>. so the <laughs> it was pretty remote, and uh, the security there was was fairly good. So. Um, yeah, I, I, I didn't make it very well known and I, I certainly didn't get involved in acting in the film. So, uh, I was behind the scenes and I was constantly in the ear of Brian and, and other actors, uh, to the chagrin of the producer, um, trying to explain to him why I thought certain lines were flat and why I thought other stuff, uh, really flew. So, and, and thankfully, um, uh, I got a lot of uh, ear from Brian, uh, and, and he did actually do a lot of the stuff that, uh, I had suggested. So we have a great working relationship and I enjoy speaking with him. That's why I brought the second project to him initially. Mm -hmm. And, um, and he's very eager to do it. So we're, uh, we're moving toward with the help of Brad Furman, a, a great director. Uh, we're moving forward with a, uh, a screenplay that we're trying to get perfected and, and, uh, go from there. That's amazing. I, again, I was going to talk about the movie stuff later on in our conversation, but I, I find it quite funny, the image of like, oh, we'll let you be on set because it's a movie that's about you and why not? And then you're suddenly like, let me talk to the lead man about this. And I can just see some producer being like, Shoot, can we uninvite this guy? He's like really <laughs> harsh in my vibe right now. <laughs> Who invited this guy? Well, yeah, because producers are all about time. Right. Because uh, time is money. So uh, if I'm talking to the uh, one of the actors and um, they decide at the last minute, I mean, we, we know what we're going to shoot that day. We get the day, uh, the day sheet, mm -hmm. and um, I would try to catch them a little bit earlier. But, you know, when they change what they're going to say or do, uh, yeah, it could slow things down. And there's a bondsman there who's making yeah. sure that you're staying on time. And, and uh, yeah, so I, I was, a, I, I guess, a producer's nightmare. Yeah, yeah, they're like, we can't really uninvite the guy, but how do we mention to him sort of, is there like a polite way where we can say, stop talking to Brian Cranston in the middle, <laughs> in the middle of shooting? I don't know. It, it, but obviously, it, you wouldn't have done it if you, if you didn't have a good reason to, right? You're not just trying to get FaceTime with the, the lead man. You're trying to make the movie better. So I suppose, I suppose there is some tension there that, that's worth 
worth uh, the juice is worth the squeeze at some level. Yeah, I mean, I'll give you an example, a quick one. You know, the in the Infiltrator, they ended the film fictionally, where the wedding actually occurred instead of it in reality went down in a bachelor party the day before. So um, the main bad guy from Colombia, Roberto El Caino, uh, was in the film a fugitive at that stage and showed up at the wedding. Uh, allegedly uh, having been able to use another name and staying under the radar. And so Brian said to me, um, what would you have said to Roberto if he showed up at the wedding? And I said, I think I would have said something along the lines of, it's wonderful to see you, but there's a part of me that wishes you weren't here. Because we had developed a friendship. And he said, oh, that's it. We're, we're going to use that. And, um, and that's exactly the line that they wound up using during it. So, no, I, I know it's really important for me to be uh, very selective in the picking of times where I might say that type of stuff. And I would be emailing back and forth with the director uh, the night before when I got that day sheet um, and giving him some of my thoughts. So a lot of times he would actually deliver that. Um, and, and believe me, there were a lot of talented people there. So I I... I, I only had a minimal effect on what was uh, actually said uh, on the screen. So backing up the trucks, now that people are thoroughly confused, all right, he was in a movie, something, something with Brian Cranston. What does the guy actually do? I, I've, I've covered some of this in the intro, of course, but you started working initially with, what, U.S. Customs chasing money launderers for Pablo Escobar? Is that... Uh, is, actually, I... I started with what was then called the... Um, Criminal Investigation Division of the IRS. Ah. And um, in that case, uh, I wound up working with other agencies on drug cases, handling the kind of the financial side of it. It's typical. I mean, the, the that agency is the agency that did the paper trail that put Al Capone away for income tax evasion. So uh, I was really excited to get involved with that agency. I had an accounting background business administration finance major, and uh, I wound up getting involved in uh, the criminal investigation division of IRS doing forensic accounting work for law enforcement. Then I decided when we were working on, um, on with customs that uh, it was probably better for me to move over to customs uh, as a special agent. In, in comparison to other agencies, customs was um, moving pretty fast. I mean, for example, I, I, at IRS, it might take three levels of review on an affidavit for a search warrant um, before I could get the search warrant approved. And, you know, you've got to make sure that your probable cause is fresh. And so at times you would almost lose the freshness of the probable cause through all the bureaucratic layers. And I'm talking to the customs guy and he, I said, well, wh what do you guys do? He goes, well, I write the affidavit. I pick up the phone. I call the magistrate. I go to the magistrate's house. He reads the affidavit. He goes, okay, that's good. And he gives me the search warrant. I said, I, I think I need to work for you, uh, for your <laughs> agency. And, and that's what brought me there. And, and then uh, at IRS, I was trained as an undercover agent as well and did undercover. But when I went to customs, uh, after getting through all the basic trainings, I, I was also trained there as a long-term undercover agent. How do you get started in an undercover operation? I know you eventually went to the DEA, uh, of course, so moving around a bit, but how do you get started in an undercover operation like this? You can't just walk into a bar in Medellin with a Hawaiian shirt on and be like, sure would like to meet this Escobar fella I keep hearing about, right? That's not, you got to have so many connections and back backstopping and where do you even begin? Yeah, well, it's, it's a much more sophisticated plan than a lot of people would um, uh, recognize. It's, it starts with, First of all, you've, you've got to have the personnel who are able to do that type of work. And yeah. that starts with volunteering uh, because they can't make you work long term undercover. So I I volunteered because I, I was on a task force that was uh, trying to identify and prosecute the most significant money launderers for the Medellin cartel. And we were having, I would say, average success at best, not even that really. Uh, and, and I decided that well, we decided that we needed a new tool in our toolbox, and that was going to be the long-term undercover technique. So we needed somebody who was going to be trained as a long-term undercover agent who had the capacity, the, the ability to be able to convincingly pose as a money launderer. My background is very different from most people who are law enforcement officers. I'm not a criminal justice major. 
I was a, a business administration finance major, did a lot of accounting, worked in a bank and a brokerage firm. I know books and records, having worked for the IRS. Um, and so I could, in my view, I felt as though that my background tended to give me an opportunity to be able to more convincingly pose as a corrupt businessman. And so I went through the undercover training, which is done not just by trainers, former long-term undercover agents. Uh, my mentor uh, at the, that training was a guy by the name of Joe Pistone, that the book and the movie Donnie Brasco is named after Joe and I. Um, our families uh, have become good friends. Uh, I talk to him often, and uh, he's he he made a big difference in in my life and my understanding of about the effective ways of doing long term undercover. And so, once you get through of all that, now you need to actually, uh, if you're going to go after an organization, you've got to go through a written proposal. Um, you know, a, an overview of the project, an it's like assessment a business of how plan. It's like a business plan. That's exactly yeah. uh, what it is. You've got to talk about your resources, what you're going to need. You know, in, in that particular case, as I wrote in the book, um, if I had asked for more than – I think the, the cutoff point was $30,000. If I would asked for more than $30,000 in operating funds, then the, uh, the plan had to be approved in Washington. And I knew letting you know this get to the Washington level was not going to be – at least in my view, is not going to be to my advantage because I really felt as though we needed to stay as low under the radar screen as we possibly could. So I asked for like twenty nine thousand nine hundred bucks, <laughs> and uh, and and but and the, an advantage is once you get approved, this is called an attorney general's exemption. The attorney general, his or herself, has to actually approve the written plan along with certain agency heads. And that's because you're going to be committing a crime, and the crime you're going to commit is money laundering. And so what uh, we did uh, is we we laid out the plan, we got the approval, and under that proposal, you're allowed to use the profits from the undercover operation to defray the cost of the undercover operation. Well, it didn't take us long to, before we were making millions of dollars, <laughs> and we had more than enough money without using taxpayer funds. Uh, in order to uh, to really sophisticate the operation. But key to the operation were three different informants. Two uh, were informants of mine who were associated with one of the uh, New York Italian-American organized crime families. And one of them was an informant from Colombia who had an import-export business. So with those informants, we, we were able to do a lot. Can I pause you for a sec? I, I just think it's so funny because, of course, what people are are hearing right now, and I know you, we're we're probably going a little bit fast for some folks, so I, I want to reiterate the idea that you ask for this smaller amount of money so it doesn't have to go all the way up the food chain, knowing also we're going to be committing a crime, and that entire the entire po point of this crime is to generate a ton of of cash, illicit cash. So you could have asked for like a dollar. <laughs> right or whatever you needed to buy like the calculator and and folio that you needed to start laundering money and and some other sort of expenses but like you you're really then it's like people who don't know what money laundering is right and we'll get to that in a second but if you're if you're posing undercover as a drug dealer and your crime that you're going to be committing is you're going to be slinging cocaine you're going to have profits from that cocaine that you can then put back into your undercover illicit business money oh, laundering there are there are, there are department of justice guidelines you can't uh sling cocaine oh uh, i see you know yeah no you you know the, that's got to be approved at the highest levels i would imagine in order yeah. for you to be able to do that and and also please keep in mind also that money laundering facilitates crime and mm -hmm. so we were authorized by the attorney general to actually commit that money laundering offense but we needed an, we needed startup money uh, in, in the way the operation worked, my whole theory is that you don't want to be knocking on somebody's door and, and trying, as you said in the beginning, uh, hey, where's that Pablo, Pablo Escobar dude? I want to meet him because I can launder money. No, you don't do it that way. My whole theory kind of goes back to uh, high school. If you want to date the cheerleader, the, the captain of the cheerleaders, you don't go up and ask her. You know, you've got to have somebody put that idea in the cheerleader's head. And so in this instance, what we did, my partner, amazing undercover agent, better undercover agent than me, more of a street guy, uh, ran as my manager of my street operations. I mean, when he walks in a room, I had to show like documents and this, that, and the other thing and convince people I was what I was. This guy walks in a room and they go like, I don't know what crime he commits, but he's definitely a criminal. Mm -hmm. And um, so he worked with them with the understanding in their mind that 
my boss is the one who's helping me to open the accounts and get some of this money laundered. But he, he never wants to meet you. He's not going to do big money. But let me tell you, brother, if you could ever meet him and you could convince him otherwise, the, sea, the river of money that could be laundered would be outrageous. But he works for his own family, meaning an organized crime family. And that's really his main, his main job. So he's not really wanting to expose himself. So after six months, they were banging on the door. They wanted to meet me in the worst way. And that's how we really were able to, uh, to get them to, uh, to, to, to get us moving. And then if people didn't want to do it the way I wanted it done, because like so many undercover agents feel as though they've got to please the bad guy, which is the worst thing they can ever do. And, and my theory was, okay, I'm going to deal with this first level guy. And if I can't get him to sell to his clients, which are the major cartel leaders, if he can't convince them that I need to be more involved in managing their assets so I don't get caught. I can't just take money in, launder it, and send it back. If he can't get them to do that, then I'm not going to work for him, with them anymore. And eventually I told the guy, I said, listen, you can, I'm, I'm hearing you. You can't convince them. That's okay. You can put us face to face. Let me convince them myself. If I fail, we'll continue to work. But I want that opportunity to be able to convince them. And that's how I met the, the bigger guys. That makes a lot of sense. I'm I'm stuck on one thing you'd mentioned before about not being allowed to sling cocaine or whatever. I, I've, I know I've interviewed some mobsters on this show before, and I always make them show me their court documents, and they always get permission from. Oh, well, I guess it is what you said, right? They get permission from the Department of Justice to do to basically commit certain crimes uh, as part of their agreement to be an informant. And it's, a lot of the times it's like racketeering. But I remember on one set of documents it was like associated with these sales of illicit substances or something like that. And I assumed yeah. that meant drug deals. Uh, drug yeah, dealing. no, you, you can do buy busts and you can do uh, buys or, or, and you can sell uh, Coke in smaller quantities that is approved to be done. If, you know, and a lot of times this, this is the way it really does work in the big world. And that is that somebody says, okay, well, um, I'll, I'll give you a sample so that you can you can test it. And, you know, the big deal, let's say, is going to be a thousand kilos. Uh, maybe they'll take him, let him cut into a kilo and, um, and, and take, you know, so many grams, but they're not going to on a regular basis. And with, uh, in, in, in the guidelines, they're not going to allow a lot of, a lot of dope to move. Now, in, in our case, I must admit that there was a, a, a time in Detroit and I thought it was the stupidest thing that, that could have ever been done. I think it was 109 kilos. They let that walk. Wow. That was ridiculous. Jeez. They sold it to, they sold it to uh, drug traffickers from, um, from the Middle East. I think they were Iraqis. And, and, uh, but I haven't properly identified in the book, The Infiltrator. That was a decision that was made on the ground that DEA went crazy over because <sighs> customs should not have. No. made that they tried to claim that they did that because they didn't want to compromise the undercover operation but that's ridiculous um that's and, crazy and so yeah that's where yeah, i'm from so I'm, I'm from detroit and and there's a lot of iraqis there uh but a lot of them are christian and catholic and there's, there's they were gr sorry go ahead they were they were christians yeah so if they're christian and uh, or potentially catholic there's a, a group that no one has ever heard of outside of michigan apparently in iraq called chaldean have you heard of this yep they, yeah. they were Chaldeans. Okay. Yeah. That, yeah. It's in the. Uh, I identified common. him in the book. They're, they're Chaldeans. Yeah. That's that was the, tons. You know, you grew up with these guys. They're all over. Like they're in your school and you know your gym and like a lot of them are of course normal upstanding citizens of the United States. So I want to highlight that. Like absolutely. You know absolutely. This is, it's it's just like Italians and mobsters. You know, one in a one in a million or so uh, are 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 into organized crime. So I just wanted to highlight that because <laughs> I hate you know you got to be careful when you paint people with a brush like this. Uh, when we're talking about organized crime, but it makes sense that they were dealing with Chaldeans because there's like a large organized criminal contingent of Chaldeans, which no one has heard of, but specifically in Detroit area, Dearborn, Michigan, where I grew up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and the Coke was actually being flown, uh, drone, driven up uh, from uh, Miami on 18 wheelers up into Detroit. But a lot of times wow. uh, the Medellin cartel 
they work closely with the Canadian Italian organized crime and and Canadian Italian organized crime and the biker gangs control virtually every port in in Canada, uh, including you know, those that are in um, uh, in Montreal that are north of Detroit, and so um, a lot of the coke actually comes come yeah a lot of the coke actually comes in from uh, from Canada and comes from north down to south into what, into Detroit. What organized crime is in Canada? You mentioned bikers. That makes sense. I, I guess when you think of Canada, you don't think of organized crime, but there, surely there are groups. Oh, yeah. oh major, major organized crime, uh, Canadian-Italian organized crime, just like there's American-Italian organized crime. Uh, they work very, very closely with the Hells Angels uh, in controlling uh, the ports in, in Canada. It's common knowledge your listeners should just put in you know uh, canadian organized crime bikers uh ports and they'll get all kinds of information about it i'll have to do it. i'd love to do a show about canadian organized crime because you never you never put those words together it's just not a thing uh especially... i testified yeah, yeah i testified as an expert witness in canada against three major italian uh, uh, canadian organized crime figures and um they had these massive operations massive Scary. Yeah, I guess that stuff's still alive and well. So how do you build a, a background? You know, if you're undercover as a drug dealer, you pretend to be a dealer, you learn about drugs, maybe some other guys vouch for you, but you're undercover as a money launderer. So what do you need? You need like, I'm imagining you basically have to build an office and get a bunch of tax returns or financial documents and you got to have fake clients, you got to have a fake company. Like, it's not as easy as just being like, yeah, I know this guy who sells heroin. Yeah, I realized that I, we couldn't do this in a in the way that sometimes uh, law enforcement traditionally does it. They'll, mm -hmm. as you say, open up a business and it's kind of like uh, put the lights on when the bad guys are in town. Shut the lights off later. You yeah. can't do that. So I was blessed with. I thought you know not just. <laughs> It was an advantage that I had a friendship with the leadership at Customs, but then in addition to that, I had worked with them already while I was with IRS, so they knew that I was serious about what it is that I wanted to do, mm -hmm. and and they gave me 18 months before I even came on stage to put my backstop together, wow. and my theory was that I, I needed to be embedded in real businesses, so with the help of those three informants, as well as what I would consider to be a concerned citizen who who had other businesses, I was embedded in a, a real investment company, a mortgage brokerage business. We had a jewelry chain with uh, 30 locations on the East Coast, an air charter service with a private jet, and even a brokerage firm with a seat on the New York Stock Exchange. So when I would entertain uh, targets, uh, they could come back anytime they wanted and all those businesses were 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 operating 24 7 and i was involved in them um it wasn't uncommon for me let's say they might come to florida we i i had a a guy who was at one time um a bodyguard for a capo uh, i i prosecuted him most of the informants that i had throughout my law enforcement career were people i prosecuted they knew that I would treat them fairly. It wasn't personal at all. Uh, we put cases together against them, and and I tried my best to put the biggest, heaviest sentence against them that I possibly could. And I also made it very clear to them: listen, your tongue is the key to getting your out yourself out of here. Mm -hmm. If you decide that you want to provide honest, substantial assistance and you want to help this country to be able to make bigger cases, then I'll help. I'll work with you, and we won't. We're not going to screw you. We're going to do the real thing the way that we're supposed to do it. And this one particular guy uh, decided to do it. He went into the witness protection program. He did five years in prison. Uh, he came back out. And he wasn't really targeted because his boss, who he was working with, wound up committing the cardinal sin. One, he was moving a lot of coke that his bosses didn't know about. And number two, he was using it. He was using it. And that's that's a cardinal sin. So nobody came to really kind of whack um, my CI, my informant. And eventually, what I needed a house when the bad guys came in town. So instead of using the uh, 350 bucks a month that they probably give me for a one bedroom studio, right? Uh, and I I no, talked I to this guy and I just said, Hey, listen, this is what we need to do. You know, you, you you're going to be my cousin. You're going to be my bodyguard. And 
one thing I'm telling you right now, if you do any contact with any of these people and I don't know about it and it's not authorized, I promise you, we will find a way to prosecute you again because that's a, that's a big no, no. You're not that the informants are not allowed to, to do that type of thing. You got to stay on script. And as long as you stay on script, this is what I'm looking for. Um, let's take pictures with me and your family. I'm your cousin. Uh, we'll have those that we'll be able to put around the house. My story to these guys is going to be that this is my house, but my cousin stays there with his family when I'm not around. I'm not around most of the time. So he would leave and go into a hotel if, uh, if bad guys came in town for two weeks. He'd leave. I'd have the house. It was a nice house. It was uh, the type of situation. I mean, like, you know, you went into the bedroom and you opened the master closet uh, and there was a three foot walk in safe. Yeah. You know, wow. and um, and so and and this guy uh, enabled me through other contacts to be involved in the the brokerage firm uh, as as a. Uh, an advisor to the brokerage firm. So it wouldn't be uncommon for the bad guys to come in town. I'd entertain them in Florida. We'd get on the private jet. We'd fly up to Teterboro. Uh, there'd be a limo at the, at the base of the stairs when we got off, get in a limo, go down to wall street. We'd go into the, the brokerage firm. I talked to them about, you know, what we did at that time before nine 11, uh, we, because we had a seat, I could take them on the, on the floor. Of the stock exchange. Oh, wow. So I took them on the floor of the stock exchange and, you know, everybody's screaming and they're doing what they're doing. And I, I could explain to them a little bit about what was going on at night. There might be something going on at, uh, on, on wall street, like for an IPO and a, and a, um, an initial, uh, public offering where there would be, a, a meeting where investors would be there and stuff. And i sometimes I'd take them, you know, to something like that. But most importantly, I was in social clubs that, you either had to be uh, a politician or a gangster or both to be able to be a member. And, you know, so I, I would be able to take him to the social club. And um, this one guy, Roberto El Cayeno, who was the most important guy for me to get close to. Roberto was a jeweler, had a high-end jewelry store, uh, worked, had, had that in L.A., he had an import export business. Uh, he exported seafood. You can imagine what that was used for. Yeah. And, <laughs> and he was also a real estate developer uh, and a, a fight promoter. Of and, course. Um, <laughs> it goes without saying. He, he was in a boxing and promoted <laughs> fights. So why, why is, what is up with, I, this is a whole other show, but what is up with boxing and illicit money? Like it's just, you can't, there's so much of this. Yeah. From the Kinahans to, I mean, it's just all over. It's like you can't separate those two things. The, the sport is wrapped in corruption. Yeah, for those who read The Infiltrator, you'll, they'll find out that one of the launderings that we did was to finance uh, a, a world championship fight. It was the super flyweight, uh, the champion from Mexico against the champion from Colombia. And it was at the uh, Jackie Gleason Arena. And it, it was really weird. I mean, I came in with Roberto because he was one of the uh, promoters of the fight. We we used the drug money to actually, we put it through my, uh, my mortgage company, made it look like a loan. And that was actually used to, to uh, pay for uh, some of the, the costs of the fight. Most of their money that they were making back then was cable. Uh, it probably is now too, uh, but they were making money from the cable. But there were a lot of people. There were a couple thousand people there at that fight. So oh, on that like rings... the pay per view cable, yeah, okay, yeah, that makes pay per view sense. I was cable. Like, the mafia sells cable. That makes so much <laughs> sense now. No wonder the pricing and service sucks. Yeah, okay, that yeah. that makes more sense. But it was kind of weird being uh, right there at ringside because every time you watch a fight, you always, I always get kind of interested in who are those people that are sitting right in that first row? Yeah. You know, and I get Roberto Elcano, who's one of the major distributors for the Medellin cartel, sitting next to me. On the other side, I've got this Cuban uh, mobster who's a distributor for him. And, um, and, and we're sitting there watching uh, the action. And, and uh, it was kind of surreal. But, but that, you know, that was what my life was back then. Yeah, God, that must have been. I, I really feel like this would have been such a fun job to have in many ways. I mean, stressful, but like when you're in your, how old were you at this time? Twenties, thirties? I was in my thirties. I was uh, during this operation. I was from thirty six to thirty eight. Okay, you're just unfortunately at the point where you realize you can probably die and that this isn't a good idea all the time, right? <laughs> like it'd be great if you were twenty eight and you're doing this. You're like. 
I'm riding in private jets, front seat at a boxing match. Uh, I've got all these crazy mafia guy friends, only I'm not going to prison because I'm the one putting them in prison. And we, you know, we can do whatever we want in a lot of ways. But yeah, 36, 38, you're starting to be like, these guys could just bury me out here and no one would ever find me. And maybe I have a family at this point, right? So, yeah, Oh, I, I did. Would, and, you know, my no. children were 9 and 11. Oh, um, and my wife and I had been... Um, at that stage, we'd been married 13 years. Mm -hmm. So, um, but you know, you talk about putting a young kid out there, 26, 27 years old. That's the worst plan worst in the idea. world. Worst idea in the world. You've got to have somebody who's going to be rooted, who has family, who, um, you know, if, if you took a new hire and freshly married, move him to a city where he doesn't have family his wife's got to stay home alone and he's flying all over the world. Um, first of all, you're headed for a divorce. There's no doubt in my mind on that. And you're not going to have somebody who's grounded, who's going to be thinking operationally as much as they, as they really should be. Where I knew, and, and this is something that every single undercover agent, I stress to them, they have to remember. The bad guy's smarter than you. Mm -hmm. Don't ever forget that. Bad guy's smarter than you. They're looking for any kind of little tiny sign that they can possibly see. And if they pick up on it, you're dead. And so although people go like, wow, you were in Paris for and going to these great hotels and restaurants and all that other yeah. stuff. And wasn't that exciting? I go, no. You know no. what? What really got me and what I don't think is a good idea, but I confess to other undercover agents was my motivation and can be your demise is that information became my heroine. I had to get the next big piece of information and the risk had to be higher than the last risk or I wasn't accomplishing my mission. I had to be laser. I, I, you know, I was in the military, but I was never in, in a battle where somebody was shooting at me. And but it, I got to think that it's very similar to being on a battlefield where you have to recognize that I have to be absolutely laser focused on my enemy. And I can't, although I really do care about my wife and my kids, I can't be thinking about that. I can't be thinking about the birthday party I just missed. I can't be thinking about that at all. Mm -hmm. That has to get boxed up. I have to have two brains. My, my Musella undercover brain and my Mazer brain, both of them have to be functioning at the same time because everything that I do on behalf of Musella has to be calculated by Mazer. I have to move conversations in directions where I'm getting actionable intelligence. So, and I can't do that if I'm just hanging out. To clarify, Musella was your undercover identity and you know, your real name, of course, Bob Mazer. Just for just I'll throw that in the intro, but just in case people are like, wait, who, what? Yeah, that that actually makes a ton of sense. And I, I was also wondering how you could possibly enjoy it, because on the one hand, it's like you got to live the high life. If you're a money man of a drug cartel, you got fancy food, great hotels, private jets, you're balling out of control. And then it's like, but also if you get too drunk and you say something and the guy's like, wait, what? You said that, but that you told me. And then they start to realize that something's wrong. You're like, I'm possibly dead now. Or the like best case, the operation is blown. Worst case, you're going to go. You're going to be in a hole in the desert or whatever. Yeah. That's I'm a scary. I'm a detail freak by nature, whether I'm doing undercover or whatever. I mean, accounting background, formerly IRS, mm -hmm. you know, I, I take a different approach. Um, my, and I was, you know, until I got into college, I was uh, at best a B minus student. And in college, maybe I was a B student, but I tried harder than anybody else that was out there. There's nobody that can outwork me. I promise you that I will work harder and more focused, uh, than the person who gets the easy A. And for me, that works. Um, and so I was constantly looking to make sure that I could get new actionable information. And at times, some of the information was so mind boggling. I mean, I worked myself into, you got to remember, there's two sides to this as a money launderer. You can't launder money all by yourself. And so there are other people who are in the money laundering process. And for me, in, in that first operation, um, it was the senior executives of what was the seventh largest privately held bank in the world at the time. So I'm dealing with people on a board level um, in a situation who, 
they are representing not just my interests. I, my financial advisor also was the financial advisor for the corrupt leader at the time of Panama, Manuel Noriega. Wow. And I was getting information about Manuel Noriega on a continuing basis because he trusted me. The, the investment advisor trusted me. And, and I would, of course, bring up conversations about uh, Noriega and, and um, b because of the fact that Noriega was being paid off by the people I was working with, um, you know, on the, on the other side. But he was also, you know, he had hidden accounts for um, people who were running other countries, uh, President Zia of, of uh, Pakistan. Uh, he had, he was managing accounts actually for Casey, the CIA director at that time. There were, you know, intelligence operatives, there were drug traffickers, there were arms dealers, there were corrupt world leaders, uh, money launderers. I mean, the international banking community has a very, very unusual array of clients, but they all have the same need. And that is they have money seeking secrecy from governments. And so they're looking for people with highly sophisticated methodologies that are going to help them to be able to do it. Casey wants to do it because he doesn't want our enemies to find out who we're sending money to. Uh, Noriega wants it because he doesn't want the rest of the world to know that he's on the take. The cartel wants it because they want to be able to hide their money from the government that's going to steal it. And so, you know, everybody has that same common interest. And, and it was uh, it was part of the thing that really may, it just drove my hunger for more information. Uh, for more heroin for me, you know, to, uh, I was so excited to be able to get information that I knew was tremendously actionable. I mean, a month before we ended the operation, Roberto Alcaino had trusted me so much that he told me that, you know, there was more than a ton of dope sitting on a, on a, a dock and it was going to be coming in. A lot of people wonder why does he tell the money launderer? And that's because do the math. Um, there was, a thousand kilos or 1200 kilos each kilo is selling for at the time wholesale probably fifteen thousand dollars so there's a lot of money that has to move quickly and the people who own the product uh, want that money back within 10 days uh, in colombia so if you've got a money launder you're going to rely on you need to give them a heads up that they need to be ready and Roberta oh. gave me so much information yeah. that we were able to seize. I mean, we the customs and DEA found the load. It was in Camden, New Jersey, across the river from Philly, and it went to um, uh, to Chelsea to a warehouse in Manhattan. And uh, Roberto wound up going there. I, I told everybody, don't move that stuff because he was there when they packed the 40 foot container right. and he knew exactly how it was packed, but you know, they had to take it all apart and, and take out the couple of thousand pounds of, of Coke. So when he was there and they opened it up and now they're, they used um, customs people to pose as the warehouseman. And uh, I got to talk to Roberto about this later when he was in handcuffs and uh, months 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 later because i continued undercover for a month after he got arrested but what he wound up doing is he's he's sitting there and he's looking at these guys and he's going they're gringos their hands look like pillows they're mm. speaking english these aren't dock I'm, workers <laughs> i've never seen these guys before so he ran out of the place and get, jumped in a cab and then it was a, a chase all over manhattan that finally customs won um, wow but you know, now I had a situation where I was worried that I would be compromised because I was one of the last people he talked to before he wound up getting arrested. So we did what uh, what they did in Goodfellas. And, you know, when somebody gets arrested, you go to the mattresses and, you know, you know, all the bad guys don't talk to anybody. Because if you do, you never know who's on the phones, who's listening in. So I didn't talk to anybody. And then Roberto's wife, we had a, a way to send codes to one another, and um, and I wound up talking to her payphone to payphone, what? and she said, she said to me, uh, "Well, you know, Roberto has a message for you. I just visited him in the tombs in New York, and I'm like really worried about this message." And she goes, "Well, you know, <clears throat> he feels you're the only one he can trust that he wants oh, you wow. to take over." And so now, for the last thirty days, for those who saw the movie Austin Powers. 
and uh, and the character Mini Me. I became Roberto's Mini Me, and and I ran his operation. So she gives me the list of the distributors, how much product everybody's holding, needs me to collect money to pay the lawyers, um, and I'm like, I'm now right in the middle of it. And yeah, I've, I've got to pay the suppliers, and um, it was a lucky uh, accident <sighs> that that happened. But Roberto. Um, was 100% believed in me, and, and that's what got us there. You, you wrote in the book, I found out in a few days what would take a normal investigation months to learn, and this is exactly why, right? Because it's like they normally they got to do all this detective work, and they find out there's a drug shipment here. Meanwhile, you got this guy's wife and all of his associates being like, all right, here's our next 10 shipments and the dates and where they're going to be and how much is in each one, and you're like, great. <laughs> Just like, here's the document <laughs> that I would have spent a year trying to assemble and not getting on time. Probably. Yeah, we had we had undercover agents in different cities meet with his distributors to uh, collect cash from them. And we timed that at the same time of the bachelor party uh, where a lot of people came to a country club thinking that I was going to get married. And so we, we timed the pickups. And I also timed um, an offer I made to pay the suppliers in Colombia, uh, and they flew in and, and um, met me at my, well, one guy flew in with, with a, a woman who was a girlfriend of, of Roberto's uh, to pick up 400,000 bucks. And, um, and so um, I met with him. So the supplier gets arrested. Distributors are getting arrested. The bankers are getting arrested. A lot of the drug traffickers that I uh, dealt with were getting arrested. And, and, and that's basically how that particular case um, concluded. Yeah, the the essentially, what was it? You you were having a fake wedding. Can you t take us through that a little bit? Sure. Um, we needed to find a way. Um, these cases are are important, but they're mostly important for people for law enforcement to be able to put their hands on the bad guys and be able to arrest them. It doesn't prove anything if you have a beautiful looking indictment, and the bad guys are sitting in a country that doesn't allow extradition. And so we needed to come up with something that was going to, in an ideal situation, lure them to the middle district of Florida, uh, Tampa, where the indictment was returned by the grand jury. And so um, I'd say it was probably in the summertime um, in, when we had to come up with something. And one of the other undercover agents said, you know, I think they really like us. And I think that they would come to a family event. You know, what about a wedding? And, and there was a, uh, a female agent who had at times uh, appeared as uh, my girlfriend slash fiance, who now was going to be the person that I was allegedly going to be marrying. And a lot of their families, I mean, she became good friends with Roberto's wife, with other people who were involved in the, uh, in the operation. So it made sense to them. And we, that was probably the toughest undercover meeting I had was not with a bad guy. It was actually with a wedding planner mm. at the uh, Innisbrook <laughs> Country Club where I was supposed to act like, you know, the happy groom. Yeah. And, um, and somehow, we, you know, and we made all the arrangements with nobody knowing that we were really feds because, you know, the bank had a, a branch in Tampa and had financial relationships with actually some of the people who were board members at the country club. And there was no way in hell that we were going to take the chance of t saying that, you know, this is what's going to happen. Right. Oh so God. we we needed to lure them to the country club, which we did. Uh, it was a three-day affair. <laughs> I, let they me came... just, I'm imagining you with this undercover, this female undercover, and, and the wedding planner's like, what do you think of the creme brulee? And you're like, oh, yeah, it's it's great. And she walks away and you're like, OK, do you think we can lure all these guys at the same time? How are we going to swoop in and make the like you're just sitting there <laughs> tasting your fake wedding food? It's got it. It's some level. It's funny, right? It's just because yeah. it's ridiculous. Yeah, it's well, it's surreal. There's no surreal. doubt about that. Yeah, but it, I mean, it was an important part of the formula because we, you know, people came from one guy came from Pakistan. There were people who came from Colombia. A guy came from Panama. Uh, we missed a couple people uh, that, um, unfortunately, uh, we, we didn't get our hands on. But we got our hands on a lot of people that we wouldn't have otherwise gotten our hands on had we not come up with uh, that kind of a plan. So, um, you know, it's kind of like in going to today's events where you, you see this uh, FBI informant who was um, 
providing information allegedly about Joe Biden's corruption in Ukraine and and they arrested him in Miami. But the, the indictment had been returned in San Diego and you have a Miami magistrate that's going to let the guy out on bond. You know, we want it in our home court. We don't want to right. have to deal with the unknowns. And but that's even an advantage to have him in some other jurisdiction in the United States. But forget it. If you're going to have him in Pakistan or Colombia, you're not you, right. c- you cannot you could not uh, uh, get them to the United States. So, yeah. So the, the night before the the scheduled wedding, um, there was a party out by the the uh, the big pool at the country club. You know, you can imagine the carved ice and the and the string orchestra and all that other stuff. And there's a lot of people who were there um, that were posing as family that were actually law enforcement officers. And we arranged it so that we had uh, one of the informants went around to all the bad guys and said, uh, Bob doesn't know this, but we're going to do a bachelor party uh, in Tampa tonight. And so the limas will be here shortly uh, and all the guys are going to be going there. And, you know, there'll be other entertainment here for your wives this evening. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll call you when that happens. So, you know, now the limos line up. And so one or two of the family members, uh, which are really agents, get into the limo with one of the bad guys. We tried to do it that way and not put more than one bad guy in a car. And then they drove to a high rise um, that had like a 10 level parking and they went to different levels so they didn't run into one another. They get on an an elevator, they go to different floors. And when they get off the elevator, there's a full arrest team there that takes them down. And and as I noted in the book, one of the guys, there were a lot of people in disbelief, but one of the guys who uh, got off, he happened to be there was an arrest team, uniformed arrest team that included two female officers and they put the cuffs on him and the guy is laughing. And they said, why are you laughing? And he said, well, I've been to a bachelor party like this before where the women dress up as cops. And, you know, so, you know, where, you know, where's the party? And it took him a while to convince him that (laughs) he was, he was actually under arrest. So that was probably the, you're going to prison. Story. Yeah. That's, yeah. <laughs> and he's like, no, 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 no. Yeah, take me to prison, baby. Yeah. No, no, no. You're really actually under arrest and you're spending the night in jail and you're probably going to be there for 30 years after we're done with you. Like, yeah, it just took him to it, his his hangover the next day was uh, probably nothing to envy. I'm sure. Wow. That's. That's amazing. I did wonder how you managed to arrest all those people at once, because how do you, yeah, getting them to go in separate elevators is smart, right? You don't want like 30 or 40 or however many guys all in one big, big old party bus, and then you're trying to wrangle them, especially because they're all right. These are hardened criminals who are probably not super keen on going to jail and willing to kill somebody in order to avoid it. Yeah, it was like about a 30 story um, high rise in downtown Tampa. So uh, and on the top was a restaurant um, at the top where they thought that that party was actually going to occur. Funny, the funny thing is that that the owner of that restaurant was the um, it was called Macbeth's. He was the um, sponsor of the law enforcement softball team, and so we <laughs> the guys all had Macbeth shirts on um, that uh, were you know, related to the, to the place at the top. So that's what they thought that the, uh, that's what they thought the, the party was going to be. Oh my gosh, man. It's, it seems like, especially in the eighties, right? There's no email, there's no mobile phones. It must've been hard to separate this stuff from your regular family life, right? Cause aren't, aren't bad guys calling your house? Don't they have to see you in person? Yeah, there. Well, first of all, there were mobile phones. Um, I had one of those, um, giant ones. (laughs) <laughs> the sleek shoe phone, and, uh, <laughs> and, and and actually there was a New York number in it and a and a Miami number in it. Okay, um, because I was back and forth between New York and Miami, and um, and so yeah, no, I I never ever used any of the phones at my offices, undercover offices, or my cell phone to communicate with my office or with the bad guys. Um, f- I had a home in Key Biscayne. So generally speaking, uh, I would go maybe at about, oh, say 11 o'clock at night, sometimes a little bit later. There, this was the, the time frame of uh, banks of pay phones. So behind BCCI, the Bank of Credit and Commerce International, along Brickell Avenue, 
there were three long lines of payphones. There were probably 20 payphones in a row. Hmm. So there's a massive number of payphones there. I drive there. Of course, all the other cars that were parked there were Bentleys, Mercedes, BMWs. They were all guys with polished fingernails and speaking Spanish that were on the phones talking to Colombia, working their deals. I'm on the payphone and I'm talking to the prosecutor, to the case agent, uh, to my wife. And, and because everybody knew that the smartest thing to do would be to use a different payphone every day. You don't want to use the same payphones because if people pick up on that, they might tap that payphone and you don't, you don't want to make patterns. So, you know, payphones became my way um, that I would be able to communicate with other people. Sheesh, man. I, <laughs> it seems and I had weird contact that... agents. I had contact agents in each town. Yeah. So they had undercover phones. So I could use my undercover phone to call another undercover phone that was a contact agent for me. That phone was to be used only, you know, to speak with me about, you know, okay, where am I going to be? What am I doing? I couldn't have surveillance on me all the time. Um, but that's too dangerous. Um, and but, but there has to be surveillance at times when there is potentially a risk. Say, for example, if you're receiving a couple hundred thousand dollars in cash, yeah, you know, you might it might be a ripoff. So, you know, there needs to be cover teams. But for the most part, most of my meetings, um, people just knew where I was going to be, where I expected to go. And, you know, we'd, we'd operate that way. When you're creating an undercover profile, of course, you got to know everything about yourself, your undercover identity, et cetera. But when you're doing it with a bunch of other people, because you had colleagues, right, a, a lot because yep. you're running this big mm -hmm. operation. Do you, I assume you all memorize and discuss tons of the details of each of your stories with one another as well, right? Like, it's like a study group. Because I, I, I made them prepare them in writing. That so makes that sense, we could, right? Yeah, I, we'd prepare them in writing. Well, because you know what's going to happen. You're not going to be in every meeting all the time. Right. You know, I've got I've got this female agent who's posing as a fiancé who very well may wind up in the room alone with them. And then I'm not there. So we can't play off of one another on what's what's being said. So we better all have a very, very clear understanding. I mean, these things were super detailed, like what's your favorite drink? Where did, you know, what high school did you go to? What, you know, your parents, how many siblings, who's dead, who's alive, who's sick, who's not sick. I mean, to the nth degree, details. And if you weren't going to do that, then you weren't going to be involved in these meetings. There's no way because you're going to create a liability for us. Yeah, it seems like, look, if I've worked with you, let's say even for merely 10 years, right? And I'm your money laundering colleague, uh, your assistant. I got to know all kinds of weird quirks and small details about you. Like, I can't just know like, oh, yeah, Bob went to the University of Michigan. Uh, he used to be an attorney. It's got to be like he always asks for extra chili flakes and he puts it on Hawaiian pizza. And that always ruins the pizza for everyone else. And it's a running joke with our crew that you're going to go with him and he's going to order a crappy Hawaiian pizza and put chili flakes all over it. Like, you have to know these little things because... It's probably a terrible example. I suppose you could just not put the chili flakes on your part of the pizza. But it's an idea of the granular detail that you would have on a colleague or a coworker or somebody you've known for a long time. You'd have little quirks that were annoying, that were kind of funny, that other people commented on a lot. Absolutely right. And one of the things that I always tell undercover agents is when you're building your persona, you want to build it as closely to your real persona as you can. Robert Musella was a person with a business background from Staten Island who worked in a bank and worked in a brokerage firm and now was involved in an investment company, mortgage brokerage business, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, Robert Mazur went born and raised on Staten Island, had a business background, worked in a bank, worked in a brokerage firm. It was very easy, even to the point that when we started building things with respect to uh, the fiance, it was, well, how did you guys meet? Well, I use the same story, how my wife and I really met. I was really good friends with my wife before we ever started dating. And I liked her friend, her best friend. She liked mm -hmm. my best friend. We tried to set, it, set each other up. They had nothing, they wanted nothing to do with it. And we were <laughs> sitting there one day and said, well, I really like you, you know, would you like to go out? Mm -hmm. And so that became a part of the persona between me and the, and the fiance, that was how we met. We met because we were trying to hook each other up with our best friends. Best mm -hmm. friends rejected us. You know, so you want to build as much as you possibly can based upon 
what your real life is all about. I grew up on Staten Island um, in, a, in a neighborhood at the time. Well, it, it's called Mariner's Harbor. Um, at the time, it was a very Italian neighborhood. There were a lot of wise guys in the neighborhood. Um, and I wrote in the book, you know, my, my grandfather um, worked at one time, along with a lot of people from his family, the Safaro family, uh, for Lucky Luciano. And I, so I knew a lot about, you know, that stuff. And I'm, I'm, but my mom always said, you go anywhere near any of those people or you do anything that comes close to that. And, and, you know, you've had it. Uh, my mom and dad were dedicated to the idea that their two sons were going to be the first in the family to go to college. And we were, and we were going to have good educations, good businesses, uh, good business backgrounds, good and good uh, employments, and um, we weren't going to get anywhere near any of that kind of stuff. So <laughs> I didn't is, have to really worry about understanding that. Yeah. What does your mom think about you? Like, oh, my son went to college. Oh, he joined customs. Oh, he joined the DEA. Wait, now he's hanging out with all the people that I wouldn't let him hang out with when he was a kid? What's going on here? <laughs> she must not have been super thrilled about that. She must have been worried about you. Uh, yeah, she was worried about me because... Um, and she, you know, I, I guess I was her baby, you know, yeah. so, um, but, you know, she was very proud of, so as, as my dad was, my dad was a World War II vet. Um, my dad fought in, in Africa, in Italy, in, and in France, and um, hardly ever talked about it, was a very, very patriotic guy. My brother fought in Vietnam, hardly ever talks about it, um, very patriotic guy. My mom worked for the uh, U.S. Army as a civilian employee. She became the comptroller uh, at Fort Wadsworth and later Fort Hamilton, the two army bases on either side of the Verrazano Bridge. Um, family, God, and country are the mainstays of the people who meant the most to me in my life. And that's another important thing about being grounded um, because if family really, really matters to you and your maker really matters to you and your country really matters to you, you're far, far less likely to become a victim like my partner in a subsequent undercover operation who went to prison for 11 years um, and be compromised. Um, and, and it's very, very important for people who do this type of work to recognize that there is potentially, if you don't operate smartly there is a potential for you to compromise yourself and to before you even realize it slide down a slippery slope that there's no way in hell you can come back from and you know so i was very fortunate you know i i my my parents were ideal models for me um my my leadership gave me the opportunity to train me uh, I was taken very, very seriously, long-term undercover training, um, and then uh, very seriously to build this undercover operation. And I was surrounded by extraordinarily talented, talented people. You know, at the height of the operation, there were probably 150 agents, analysts, um, supervisors, administrative people, and prosecutors uh, who were part of the operation. So by far... I was not a lone wolf in this thing. I got the, the privilege of earning a leadership role in the undercover team, but there was an investigative team, a prosecution team. There were many, many other moving parts that were extremely important. And if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be having this discussion right now. Man, I, it's got to, you mentioned your, your partner in another operation went to prison. I guess it's got to be tempting at some level, knowing you got a trunk or a duffel bag with two million bucks in it to just try and vanish with it or take a couple hundred thousand off the top, especially if it's 80s, 90s money, you're talking about, you could do a lot with that. And uh, the t so the temptation is definitely there, especially if your job is to move it around and hide it. It's like, you, you probably think, well, I can let these guys know that some of this is gone and tell the other side the same thing. And I could get away with this. Hmm. Well, his compromise started even before the undercover operation because he was a young officer with very little experience, mm. who was taken from a uniform position after 18 months 
and thrown in vice because he was Puerto Rican and spoke Spanish. Mm. And they thought, well, you know, we're going to have him do undercover work. Well, that's not a reason for selecting someone to do undercover work. And then they put him uh, with two informants from Colombia who were extremely manipulative. And what he didn't realize, uh, he started making some cardinal sins right in the beginning. Initially, he did everything by the numbers. He met with another officer when he met with them. Everything was on paper. Then he started to like them. Then he started to meet with them alone. Then he started to socialize with them. I have pictures of him when he was with the two informants, with their kids and his kid. He was divorced in the, in a, a, a park and they were, you know, doing a little uh, park picnic. And so now he's with them one on one. And the very first thing that the manipulative informants did to test him was they said, <clears throat> you know, we're going to be working with you. And you're going to be doing undercover and we're going to be working with you undercover and you're an investment for us. We, we need, you know, you, you're not going to be able to do it the way you're doing it now. You're not dressed right. Um, let's go to the store and let me show you the kind of clothes you need to be wearing. So they go to the mall, shows him the clothes and the guy goes, you know what? It's an investment for me between us. I'll buy this stuff. And he buys the guys a bunch of clothes for the guy. And the guy lets him do it. Well, of course, the light bulb goes off in the informant's head and goes, hmm, I got something to work with here. So now the next thing he does, is he goes, and you know, you, you need to have some nice jewelry. And he takes this watch off of his arm. It was a Rado. It was worth about 10 grand at the time. And um, he says, here, I'll loan this to you. Mm -hmm. The guy takes it. The, the cop. Well, the cop. The yeah. cop takes it. Well, now they know, okay, He's taking this stuff. There's something else that's going on. They're hanging out personally. Um, his ba personal background was his mom was on uh, assistance living in the Bronx. Um, she, and she was ill. He had two divorces and he was paying child support out the yin yang. And he was always talking about his financial problems. <laughs> well, what do you think that's going to lead to? Yeah. And so the informants start explaining to him how it is that he might be able to make some money. And then before you know it, you know, he's down the slippery slope. Man, it's, it seems very difficult to, you really, you mentioned selecting the right people for the job. I would, how do you know if someone's going to be corruptible or not, I guess, or, or don't you? Well, <clears throat> we wind up getting polygraphed. Um, of course, I'd like to say that my former partner that did 11 years beat the polygraph yeah. um, because he's such a psychopath. But um, he uh, there are ways that people can actually study um, looking in a mirror and say false responses and eventually convince themselves that it's not that false of a response. And, you know, right. it takes a little training, but they could do it. Um, you know, you've got to know enough about the background. You've got to do a complete background. You know, do you really want an agent who has bankruptcy? Do you want a guy who's got two divorces and financial and, and in financial stress? No, obviously not. You know, you want to make sure that these are people who have uh, good, sound financial backgrounds, who have good, sound character. Um, and, and, you know, you got to do a quality background in order to make sure that you're hiring people um, who deserve this type of responsibility that you're willing to give to them. I, I'd like to say that, you know, corruption is something that only happens elsewhere. But unfortunately, it, it, it is a situation in, you know, in the, the U.S. law enforcement community, maybe not to the degree that it might be in some other countries, but it is. Um, it, it's an ongoing problem, and it's something that I I also do a lot of um, instructing or, or presenting to law enforcement agencies, and and I love to get the opportunity to talk to people um, who are in management in law enforcement and and ask them to confront themselves about the fact that what do you normally do when you have a circumstance like my former partner who went to prison for 11 years, what do you do with that knowledge? What they normally do is they try to sweep it under the rug because they really don't want the public to see that these chinks in the armor exist because they don't want the public to lose 
faith in law enforcement. Now, I can understand that kind of an approach, but my view is that you need to use that. That story needs to be used within the law enforcement community to help people to recognize how even a good guy can become a bad guy. Mm -hmm. And how it can absolutely turn around. You don't want to sweep this under the rug. You want to talk about it. You want to talk about what happened, why it happened, how you can prevent it from happening, and to help officers who might be working with another person and go, you know, I need to pull his reins in because I can see him making a problem. Uh, you know, I know law enforcement officers who deal with informants and, and the informant goes, hey, yeah, my brother's got a used car lot. And blah, 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 blah. And then another uh, officer goes, hey, well, me, I'm going to go look and see what they got on the line. No, no, you don't do business with informants mm. or family members or friends of informants. No, no, that's not part of what you're supposed to be doing. It's part of getting down that slippery slope and making stupid judgment decisions that ultimately you turn around and you go, well, why not go for a little bit more? I've already made these other mistakes. Yeah. And, and then you really make the big mistakes. I, I can see that that process right like oh he's got to use car lot he goes there and takes a look and then somebody's like oh isn't that the guy that i want give him a really good deal just give him the car well now i gave him a car okay why, why, look, you, why are you driving a used car Drive, I gotta, let me get you a nice car no i can't really do it. i mean it's just like one thing and then you're like well i didn't get in trouble for that what am i no it's part of the operation you start rationalizing this stuff and suddenly it's like dot 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 they're wiring you a hundred thousand dollars to look the other way when they do something or, or whatever. Yeah. And, and one of the things that uh, early stage stupidities that my former partner did was that, you know, he, he wanted to be a superstar. He mm -hmm. had great informants. Well, they gave him great information. Well, in turn, they were looking for a little bit of help. So he goes and tells them on two occasions about investigations that were being started focusing on them. Don't deal out of your club. They know about that club. You're going to get yourself in big trouble. And he told him another time, hey, they got a warrant for your arrest. The guy fled. He went to New York. You know, he was he was getting the opportunity to make big cases against the competitors of his informants that made him look like a superstar in the eyes of law enforcement. But he was paying a price for that as he continued to slide down the slippery slope because he was doing things that he really didn't think at first were all that bad. Because, look, I'm getting something for the government on this. So, yeah, maybe I'm helping this guy a little more than I should. But look at that. We arrested five people. We seized five kilos. We seized this. We did that. Somehow he rationalized that stuff out. I can see that, though. You know, I can see how this happens. And I I, I don't sympathize, really, or I guess because I think the guy sounds like he'd made a lot of dumb mistakes. But I can really see. I mean, and I suppose you can, too. You can really see how this is tempting in the moment, how it's easy to rationalize. Especially if you're like, look, we we arrested five dangerous people. So what? We let one other guy go and he's feeding us a ton of information. Seems like a good deal. But it's a bargain with the devil in many ways. Yep. Absolutely. There's a throwaway line in the book. And by the way, if people buy the books, please use the links in the show notes. It helps support the show. There's a throwaway line in the book. You say you're talking about meeting with sources and you say through silence and active listening, these people can offer up more than you bargained for or more than they planned on talking about. What are you using to draw people out when you're talking with them? Sure. So a good example of that, I think, if uh, your your uh, listeners watch the film, The Infiltrator, mm -hmm. um, this is a bad guy using active listening. It's Roberto Alcano. He's sitting there in a movie theater alone and... In walks Brian Cranston, and he turns to Cranston and he says, So, Mr. Musella, what can you do for me? And he doesn't say anything after that. And what happens is the person to whom that active listening comment is made becomes a little uneasy and feels like they have to fill the space. So now they've got to give the information that this guy is looking for. Best example I can give you that of what happened to me where somebody used active listening on me mm -hmm. and, and it goes to a personal story. You know, my mom was um, in the process of clearly passing away and, uh, and um, a priest from hospice came by and um, 
and he just turned to me and he said, um, how you doing? And I said, oh, I'm doing fine. And he just continued to look at me mm-hmm. in kind of an inquisitive way. And I felt like, all right, he's not buying what I said. I guess I better tell him. I said, well, you know, the fact is I'm not doing well. And this is what's bothering me. And I started opening up and I was talking to him and I was telling him things that I was otherwise not inclined to tell him. And so anytime you can use that type of an approach, instead of just trying to say, well, you know, hey, this is what I can do for you. And I can do this, I can do that, I can do the other thing. You know, my approach would be, I can help you. The way I help people changes based upon their needs, their capabilities. So what is the problem that problems you face that you need the most help on from me? You know what my, you know what my capabilities are. So what, what is your greatest concern? And don't say anything after that. Just look at them and wait. Let the time go. They're going to feel like they got to say something. Right. Um, and, and they're going to start talking about it. It's almost like the, just get enough rapport to kind of ask them what keeps them up at night and, and, and they're just going to unload on you. I would imagine a lot of these guys don't have a lot of people they can talk to anyway. Yeah. You know, um, I probably hit it off best with Roberto. One of the number one things that you have to do if you really want to try to establish rapport and, and communicate with people is you have to be willing to do the homework. Before I met Roberto, I knew I was going to have the opportunity to if I could get past guy number one. There had been failed big investigations of Roberto previously. So I knew about his family, about his businesses, what his likes, his dislikes were. Well, guess what? When I'm going to be talking to him, a lot of his likes, he's not going to know I would got this because I did my homework. But for example, he came to my home, actually my informant's home, but he came to my home in Florida through another informant. I had the use of a Rolls Royce. I knew Roberto was a collector of Rolls Royces. He had five of them. So I parked, I had it parked in the garage. And when we got to the house, I popped the garage till we walked in through the garage, never saying a word about the Rolls Royce. He saw it immediately. He was glued to it. And he's, oh, wow. I said, yeah, well, and I knew everything about that particular Rolls Royce. And I talked about it. I told him, you know, I really wanted to become a collector. Oh, I, I want to be a collector too. Now we're buddies. We're starting Mm -hmm. to become buddies. We have a lot in common. He, even though we became kind of like buddies, um, he would promise bigger, bigger jobs. And I'm getting 100,000, 150,000. I know he's moving thousands of kilos at a time. Mm-hmm. I'm not getting the biggest part of his business. Right. But he keeps promising it to me. So I went to this informant that whose home I was using, the former uh, bodyguard. And I said, you know, have, what what would you do in this kind of a situation? You know, you got this guy who's got a lot of potential. He keeps promising that he's going to do big stuff. Does a little bit here, does a little bit there, but never really delivers. He goes, oh, that's easy. Um, I'm going to give him a gift. Um, I said, a gift? What do you mean? He goes, I'm going to give him something that's... The next time he says, listen, we're partners. We're going to do this. We're going to do another thing. I'm going to give him a gift and I'm going to bless our relationship and it's going to be a gift that's really going to be something that's meaningful to him. Now, Roberto was a religious guy and I said, you know, the government's going to give me like a 12 inch black and white TV if you give him as a gift. I mean, I, what am I going to do? He goes, right. here, let me show you the type of thing I'm talking about. So he goes into his safe and he takes out this gold uh, studded, it was like quarter inch bars of gold and studded with diamonds. It was a cross. Wow. And it was worth like 25 grand. Yeah. So I said, well, that's great, but you know, we're, we, we can't buy that from you. So he goes, no, here's, I got an idea. I'll loan this to your agency 
and you just make sure you get it back from them at the end of the thing. And I go, well, I'm a dot the I cross the T guy. Uh, I'm going to go back to my boss. I wrote up this mm. borrow agreement <laughs> and um, we said that, okay, he wasn't getting any money for his cooperation. Right. Okay. Uh, and so we said, okay, we'll borrow this. We'll try to get it back for you at the end. If we can't get it back, it's worth 25000 and we'll give you a $25,000 award for your help in this case. So with that, signed off by my boss, I get the cross. So now <clears throat> it's a time when Roberto flies into Teterboro with me. We're at the brokerage firm. Um, <laughs> the guy at the brokerage firm did a great job. He, uh, we're, we're sitting there talking now. He, he's related to the guy that I'm is my informant. So he knew who I was. We had him signed up as an informant as well. And, you know, he starts with the story of like, you know, this freaking SEC, they're just giving me a hard time because my last name ends in a vowel. They think everybody who's, everybody who's Italian is in the mafia. This is right. garbage, you know, blah, 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 blah. So we leave there, we go to a social club. Now we're in the, the limo, we get to his, his apartment building, which is like right near the United Nations. And the female agent is in the car. He goes to get out. And just as he's closing the door, I grab it and I open it up and I go out. And I close the door and I said, you know, Roberto, you've told me many times that you know, you're prepared to begin a partnership with me. I, you know, I'm not an idiot. I know, you know, what we're doing right now is you're putting your toe in the pool. You're not jumping in the water. I mean, what's the matter? Don't you trust me? What's, what's going on? He goes, oh, I trust you. We're like brothers. I go, if we're going to really get involved in this business, this is a situation where we have to make a promise to one another. And the promise is that I'm, I'm prepared to die for you. Are you prepared to die for me? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, we're, we're in it. We're blood brothers in this thing. I go, all right. That being the case, my family has a tradition. And in honor of that tradition, we have a gift for you. And this is, my, is our gift to you in honor of the partnership that we now have. Mm -hmm. And he opens it up. Now, this guy's a high-end jeweler. He opens oh, up the... He opens this thing up and he's got this $25,000 cross. Oh, he couldn't believe it. Oh my God. I said, and there's one other thing. And now an agent's not going to do this, but I said, see her in the car. I'm 30. And at the time I was 37. I said, I'm 37 years old. I have no kids. My family's Italian. That is not acceptable. So she's going to be my wife. Don't ever talk business in front of her. Never. And as long as we, you honor that and you honor the fact that we're prepared in our partnership to risk our lives for one another, let's do it. And he said, okay, compadre, I'm, I'm in. The money started flowing like crazy. Mm. And, um, and it worked. Because I don't think in a million years at that stage, he thought that I was an agent. Never. And, and, and nor did his wife. And the day that they did this, they arrested him and they did the search warrant on his, on his apartment by the UN. So his wife eventually gets in touch with me, m making me the mini me. And, um, and she goes, thank God DEA did not take the, the splash board out from underneath the dishwasher because that's where Roberto's fake passport and a lot of the blocks of cash were hidden. Oh my God. But I need to give you, she goes, I've already destroyed the passport. I tore it up. Now, I didn't believe that that would, he, that, I don't think that she did destroy it because he would have needed that in order to get access to accounts that were in that name. Mm. But she said she'd already destroyed it, but she wanted to give me the money uh, because that money needed to go to the lawyers and they need, they, you know, they needed help. And, and then I needed to work with their distributors and stuff. But, you know, little things like that, um, little things, like taking the time to really understand who these people are and, and what makes them tick. Um, doing, uh, not only just doing your homework on that, but also knowing to be asking these 
open-ended uh, questions uh, that, that you should be asking. Preparing yourself for being compromised. I, in advance of being with these guys, I thought about all that. And of course, everybody goes like, well, people not in law enforcement, not in law enforcement, they go, what if they told you the only way they're going to do business is you got to snort a line with them. Mm -hmm. And I go, well, that's really easy because I had this built into my background. I've already told them, listen, you guys are the cherry on the top of the cake. My bread and butter is my family. Mm -hmm. If they think that I'm out of control, they're not going to give me the tens of millions of dollars that I wind up having to move for them. You're going to get me killed. So if that's that important to you, take your line and put it where the sun doesn't shine because mm -hmm. I am not taking a chance of losing my main gig. Now, the other problem that I had was, of course, women. So, and I wasn't prepared for this one. So I'm with the, the first level guy and we're at a men's club and he comes by and this is in the, mo this is in the movie. Um, and he's got two women, one under each arm. And he goes, Mr. Bob, this is for you. Uh, take her upstairs into the private room. And my mind's flying like a thousand miles a second. And that's when I came up with the idea of, listen, I'm a 37 year old guy. I'm well, then I was 36, a 36 year old guy. I have a fiance. I've never been married before. I don't want to screw this thing up. Thanks, but no thanks. It ain't going to happen. And they had a funny line in, in the, uh, in the movie where Cranston delivers that line and says, well, you know, I have a fiance and I can't do that. And it, I have a fiance and I don't want to compromise that. And he goes, so you have a fiance. So come on, take the girl. No, so, you know, but I, I, I hadn't thought about that type of compromise and I, and I really should have, but you really need to pre-think yeah. a lot of that, that type of stuff out. You know, you got to have really your stuff. You got to be convinced, convicted as well, right? Convinced of your own, uh, of your own kind of red lines. Because I, I can imagine it would be tough to be in that situation. They're like, "All right, don't do the line, but come on, man, no one's gonna come." And you're like, "Well, I'm just serving my country. I guess I'll just, you know, I don't have to, I don't have to go all the way. I can just kind of hang out for a minute, have a drink, right? I mean, it's really, it's a real slippery slope, especially when you're a 37 year old guy and you're with a bunch of gangsters. And you're, it'd be an easy thing to rationalize, I think, at that point. Well, I, one of the things that stuck out in my mind was, you know, the first thing that Joe Pisone taught me, which was think trial from day one. Remember, there's mm -hmm. going to be a jury of 12 of your peers who are going to be, or 12 of their peers, but they're going to be everyday people. Mm -hmm. Do you, and, and keep in mind also that you may, you need to, you need to be convinced that your informant or even the bad guys if you're not recording it, they may be recording it. Right. And carry yourself like every single second that you're in this mode, you're going to have to show to a jury and not be ashamed of. Right. Right. Oh, man, that makes a lot of sense. And it, good. Think of trial from day one. And uh, nothing, nothing. <laughs> Nothing kills the mood when you're being presented with two uh, beautiful women, like thinking of your trial and having to talk to 12 boomers about why you did what you did, right? And your whole, yes. you know, your conviction is based on whether or not the old lady staring at you thinks you're a decent person after you tell this part of the story. Uh, you know, and, and almost Stockholm syndrome almost occurred for me with respect to the jury in that in this first case. I got on the witness stand in the middle of March and I got off in the middle of June. I was on the witness stand every court day for three months. And so the jury really, really knew me <laughs> and really, really knew the defendants and the lawyers. And one of the things that I try to help undercover agents know is that there is a definite formula defense attorneys use to attempt to embarrass agencies and agents sure. in undercover operations. And one of them is role reversal, role reversal. So do not ever answer a question because you're trying to be courteous to a proposed to a question posed using your undercover name. One of the lawyers, a guy named Jay Hogan, who is a big representative of, uh, of Colombian drug traffickers out of Miami, um, would 
<laughs> started it, I always saw calling me Agent Musella. And I would politely say over a period of almost three months, Mr. Hogan, my name is Mazer. Musella was my undercover name. And then I would answer the question. And eventually it got to the point where he would call me Musella and I could look up and see the jury and see them roll their eyes and kind of look at me with sympathy in their, in their faces. And so I thought, you know, I, I knew the judge, Judge Hodges, pretty well for many cases. And, um, and I decided to take a risky chance and not every undercover agent should do this because you could get locked up doing it. But what I said was, uh, Mr. Hogan, my name, you know, you've, you've called me Agent Musella hundreds upon hundreds of times. Um, if you'd like, tomorrow I'll bring a name tag. My name is Mazer. <laughs> and um, so, ha, ha, ha. Next day we come in. In, in between my notes, I have a yellow sticky. I had two yellow stickies. And with a black Sharpie, I wrote Mazer. <laughs> First question out of the box from Hogan. Agent Musella, blah, 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 blah. I took it out and I put it on my chest <laughs> and I said, uh, Mr. Hogan, I promised I'd bring uh, a name tag and, um, and here it is. And, and, and my name is Mazer. And, uh, he tried to laugh it off and the jury laughed. And, mm. and so then he, he, he w uh, walked toward me and, and then he was walking back from the podium. And as he had his back to me and I said, and we all know, you know, my name is Mazer. And you could hear a pin drop. Wow. And he turned around because I had told him, I forgot this part. I had told him, oh, I brought a second one so you could put it up by the podium as well. And that's when he walked toward me. He took that and he was walking back. And I said, you know, we, we all know, you know, my name is Mazer. Wow. He turned around. He's screaming at me. You could hear a pin drop in the courtroom. Everybody knew he knew, he knew, he knew. Right. And thank God the judge, well, the judge warned me not to volunteer any information, just answer the questions, blah, 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 blah. There are other j judges that I think would have probably had the, had the jury leave and would have probably had me sent down to the lockup for at least the rest of the day. Really? But anyway, I got away with that. And, um, and Hogan completely lost credibility. Uh, in, in front of the jury. But role reversal is something that you've got to be very, very aware of. In reality, that you don't become a victim of role reversal. And two, that you have the armor on and prepare yourself with respect to, as a law enforcement officer, ever answering a question when someone poses it as though you are an agent whose last name is your undercover identity. Because they'll run with that and then they'll say, you know, this guy doesn't even know who the hell he is. Mm. Did you notice he's been answering questions to his undercover name? He loved that life so much he never wanted to leave it. He got my guy to do things that he'd never do because he didn't want this over. I mean, you could hear it all coming. Right. There's no doubt about it. Interesting. That's a very creative technique from the lawyer, but it's also, it must have been so annoying for the judge. The judge let you get away with it because she was probably super annoyed by the whole thing as well because it's just, it's, it's like this endless repetitive you correcting him, you correcting him. And, and he just thought he was going to wear you down eventually. It didn't happen. Yeah. You know, and another extraordinarily important thing is, and I, and I, when I talk to undercover agents, I bring up the example of Abraham Lincoln, who had ad, ad adversaries that he needed to somehow, these were people who ran against him, who somehow he needed to get them to be supportive of him. And what he did was he made them cabinet members within his own administration right. after he became president. So what do you do when you have a bad guy who doesn't like you and is trying to make your life miserable? And I had that happen to me in that Roberto had his main distributor was a Cuban guy who actually had been in the Bay of Pigs, who was seeing me as a challenge maybe to being Roberto's favorite and somebody who might be able to cause Roberto to do things with me that this guy would have otherwise had done with him. And so I had to find a way to get him not to hate me, not to dislike me and to see me as an ally. So what I did was I went to Roberto and I said, listen, Roberto, I would never work with anyone 
in your on your team without your permission. Um, I've noticed that um, so and so um, trying to Tuto. His name was Tuto. I said I, I I noticed how Tuto really carries himself so so tremendously. I have a few things that need to be done that I think if you'd give me the permission to work with him, he could do good things for me and I can do good things for him. He said, sure, sure. Don't worry about it. So then I had two agents posing as bad guys, couriers. And I said to Tuto, listen, man, I'm going to have a delivery 150 grand in Miami. Would you be, I'll, you know, I'll pay you uh, X, X amount. Could you pick up the 150, keep it overnight and then we'll, I'll, I'll have you deliver it to somebody else the next day. Sure, sure, I'll do that. Okay, fine. So we took money, our money, government money, not government money, it was profits from the undercover right. operation. Right. Street wrapped 150 grand. He met with the undercover, got it from him, took it to his house, held it, gave it to another agent the next day, and he got paid for being a courier. And then I said to him, you know, I know you go to Columbia a lot. I got to get these checks down there. If I pay for your airfare, could you go down there, deliver them to so-and-so in the Medellin cartel who was working with me? And, and Tuto knew this guy was somebody important in the Medellin mm -hmm. cartel. And I paid him to do it. Well, now he's working for me. Right. And now we're becoming buddies. So what happens? He comes to me and he goes... You know, Bob, I, I, I know about your family. Um, I got a problem. I got these, uh, these Cuban guys in Chicago. They owe me 250 grand and they won't pay. Um, we just need somebody to grab one of them, you know, and scare them and, uh, and, and get the money. And I said, well, uh, I, I, I don't know. You know how much that's going to cost you. Now, I had already talked to one of my informants who used to collect those types of debts and uh, the fee is going to be 50%. So I told him, you know, well, I could get somebody to do it, you know, but it's going to cost you 50% of it. He goes, well, 50% is better than nothing. Yeah. And I said, okay, well, and I said, well, <clears throat> what if they don't, what if we grab one of them and somebody says, I don't care. Um, do you want us to go all the way? You never say, do you want us to kill him? You would just say, mm -hmm. you know, do you want us to go all the way? Yeah, yeah, you got it. And I go, well, that's going to cost you even more. <laughs> and he said, well, you know, I got to get this resolved because these guys think that they can do it. They know other people. Everybody's not going to pay me. And mm -hmm. Now, instead of being my enemy, he's coming to me asking me to do work for him. Obviously, we're not going to kidnap anybody. Um, and I kept delaying that because it happened near the end of the operation. But, um, you know, that's how you have to deal with somebody. You've got to find a way to bring them as Lincoln did on his team, show them you trust him so that they can return and show trust to you. So by the way, the, the, what you're talking about is you, the guy said, I know about your family. You were using part of your backstop was that you had mafia connections. And there's a funny anecdote in the book where you go to this Italian restaurant and your fake cousin Dominic is like, if you mess with them, we'll kill you. You know who we are? Because it's to sort of show that you're connected, a connected guy. And so he knew about this. Yeah. And was like, hey, can you leverage this? Because I can't go to my own people in order mm -hmm. to. Yeah, and actually, out. I always denied to them that the mafia even existed uh -huh. because that's what a mobster does. Right. And sure. so what what we did is I had I did. You're right. I had I had this guy. Um, his name is Alex. I had Alex come to the table. And Alex always had 15 different things going. He had a suntan lotion company. He had a, he had he was selling clothing. He was doing all kinds of stuff. So he comes there. He goes, boss, boss, I, you know, I, I know you're busy, but can I just talk to you for a minute? Because I've got to get back to so-and-so on something. And I go, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, yeah, okay. I said, well, I apologize, Roberto. Um, I just need to, I need to talk to Alex for a minute. He's my cousin. He takes mm -hmm. care of sensitive things for me. So then he leaves. I didn't say anything. Roberto goes to me. He goes, let me guess. Sicilian, Brooklyn, <laughs> and started stealing cars when he was 13. I said, Roberto, you almost got it right. He started stealing them when he was 12. <laughs> and Roberto just laughed his butt off. So 
they're the ones who came up with the idea, not right. me. And that's, that's a technique you, called using passive reinforcements. You never want to tell somebody you're a mobster. You give them the passive reinforcements that makes them say to other people, he's a mobster. Thanks for watching on YouTube. Remember, you can also enjoy The Jordan Harbinger Show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Our podcast feed is a treasure trove of insights from intellectuals, authors, spies, artists, athletes, pioneers, engineers, former mafia bosses, and business leaders, all sharing their secrets to success. For more information, click the link in the description. Now, back to the show. There's a lot of seemingly close calls, like people threatening to kill you if they find out, you know, if there's a seizure and it's like, if I find out this is your fault, how does the DEA or any law enforcement agency make it seem like the seizure is is random or accidental and not tie you to that stuff? Like if you're like, hey, 100 kilos of cocaine on this dock and you know about it and people know you know about it, how are they not, how do they make it not obviously your your fault? Well, you know, each situation as it evolves, you've got to look for an opportunity to try mm -hmm. to find a way to get, you know, and we oftentimes would have someone provide reliable information to another agency or a local law enforcement agency uh, about where um, certain people might have uh, stashes of cocaine and, mm -hmm. and that type of thing. But unfortunately, I, I wish I could say that people were always looking out for me in that regard, yeah. but they weren't. And in matter of fact, in, in one instance, in my own agency in, in Detroit, uh, they filed an affidavit. They, uh, you know, said under seal. That means it goes into the safe in the, in the judge's office and people don't get it in the public record. But they filed an affidavit. Oh, I would say probably four months before the planned end of the operation, they filed an affidavit that spelled everything out, who I was, that oh, it was an undercover man. operation, the whole bit. And they never told me. Oh, that's even worse. Cause you didn't even oh, yeah. know. I didn't even know. So you're just walking around with a potential target on your back for months surrounded well, by. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta play each scenario out to the best, you know, that you can like that. When, when um, it was suspected because of the seizure, and it's the same seizure, there was a seizure of like 109 kilos of coke in, uh, in Detroit. And this, this was uh, a period of time when um, Gerardo Moncada, who was Pablo Escobar's right-hand man, this was his operation, and he gets in touch with the plane guy and also with the money broker down there and says that he's convinced that I must be a DEA undercover agent <laughs> because there's no other way that the feds could have known A, B, C, and D. Mm. So now I got to figure out how do, I, how do I try to talk my way out of that thing. I had become a friend in the mind of the, the airplane guy. Um, and I called him, he was in Miami. And I said, listen, I'm hearing some bad rumors. Um, I wanna meet you alone so that we can talk about something. And at that stage, I said to, uh, and, and, and another reason that this happened was, a lot of times we try to get to seize cash and so surveillance teams in some cities get a little bit more aggressive than others. In New York, I told, this is right after Paris, right after I get mm -hmm. a verbal contract to do a hundred million dollars in business. And it's mostly gonna be picked up in Manhattan, like a million in the morning, two million in the afternoon. And I, I talked to the uh, surveillance people and I said, hey, listen, um, we really got to try to be as light as we can on the surveillance, following these guys away and seizing money from them is going to get a little bit too risky. And I said, by the way, uh, and this is before I actually met them. I said, I learned from Roberto Elcano, like R Roberto goes to me, Hey, listen, they're going to be, 
make sure you people look for these people. They're going to be gringos, uh, <laughs> white guys. They're going to be in their 20, late 20s, early 30s. They'll have blue jeans. They'll have pullover shirts with collars, fanny packs, jogging shoes. That's what you look for. And I walk into the New York office, which I hardly ever went near a federal building yeah. during this. And I walk in there and here's a room full of guys who are like between their late 20s and early 30s. They're all white guys with uh, uh, jeans on and pullover sh solid color shirts, fanny packs and, and jogging shoes. <laughs> and I, oh, no. I tell them, you know, you guys need to try to mix it up. And it, well, you yeah. always everybody's everybody's heard of the term a New York attitude. And that's yeah. what they had. It's like, you know, hey, listen, you're not from here. We know what the hell we're doing. We're professionals, blah, blah, blah. Well, guess what? The Colombians had counter surveillance sure. out there. They identified every surveillance agent in every car. And then that's when my partner got a call with Gerardo Moncada in the background screaming that I had to be a Fed because the Feds were out there surveilling during that time frame. That's when I asked for the meeting uh, with Rudy, who was the plane guy, one-on-one uh, -on -one alone. And I begged my office, my contact agent in Miami, please, no surveillance. Because if they pick up on surveillance with me going to this hotel, I'm going to be a dead man. And all you're going to be able to do is find my body. So they agreed they wouldn't do any surveillance. I went there. I had no idea whether he was going to be alone. He promised me he would. Um, and we were on pretty good terms. And Lo and behold, when I went in the room, he was alone, thankfully. And um, and so we started talking about these issues, and I started explaining to him what I thought. I'm, now, I got to think like a bad guy. If I think like a cop, I'm, li I'm liable to say something like, well, you know, your people are probably the ones who uh, got the feds on us. Yeah. You know, we know what we're doing. No, I didn't say that. I said, I said to Rudy, I said, listen, the information you people have is extremely valuable to me. Number one, I know we haven't just started on the 100 million, but I don't want another nickel, mm -hmm. not until we resolve this problem. So find somebody else to handle the rest of that. How many cops are gonna say, you know, take your other 95 million and, and go away? Right. No, that, that's, not, that's not typical. And then I said to him, now, I need you to share with me all the details. I need you to see for sure if you have any question about the loyalties of anybody on your team i'll do the same if i identify a problem on my side i assure you the problem will be eliminated i need your assurance that you're going to do the same thing and you know rudy was kind of like well you know i'll tell them you know what you're saying and blah 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 but uh, that was the same meeting where a piece of equipment failed and my briefcase recorder was almost discovered. Oh, man. I don't know if I told that story no. before. No, you haven't. That's terrifying. Yeah. And I just, I want to say, I think it's quite funny in a in a sort of sad way that the feds are all, at the top of the show, I said something like, you can't just walk into a bar wearing a Hawaiian shirt and be like, hey, I'd sure like to meet that Pablo Escobar fella. Meanwhile, the feds are like, don't worry, we would never do that. We wear polos and fanny packs. No one's going to spot us. It's like... <laughs> <laughs> have you guys just not, I mean, do you, you, have you looked at, it's like a frat. Like you guys are all dressed the same. No, we're not. His polo's blue. Mine's pink. What are you talking about? Like it's, <laughs> what you, you guys all look the same. What are you doing? Yeah. And it's, it's yeah. just like, even you telling them, Hey, they know what your uniform looks like. You just think they would go, Oh, okay, well we should switch it up. But instead it's like, we know what's best, even though a criminal literally told you how they were going to spot us. We're going to do it anyway. It's mind blowing arrogance, really. Yeah. There were, there were unfortunately more times than I would like to remember where that type of machismo on the law enforcement side basically um, overrode the common sense uh, of those who had the illness of macho and who also forgot the most important thing that you should never forget, which is the bad guy is smarter than me. So, you know, and on the briefcase thing, I, I was afraid I was going to get shaken down in that, that hotel uh, for a recorder. So I left my briefcase outside, which had a concealed recorder inside a, th a thick uh, lid to the top of it. And um, 
but I was supposed to bring the guy some foreign bank account records. So we're into the meeting and he goes, you know, hey, did you bring those records? And I go, oh, shoot, they're, they're in, the, in my car, in the briefcase. So let me go get my briefcase. So I go and I get the briefcase. I throw it on the bed and um, continue talking about what we were talking about. And as we're talking, his eyes keep flashing toward the briefcase like he almost knows <laughs> that there's a recorder in it or something. Mm -hmm. He just keeps looking at it and looking at it. And um, finally, I take it. We're sitting op opposite one another on a ta at a table. And so when I open the briefcase, the lid goes toward him and he can't see what's in the briefcase. Mm -hmm. When I opened it, I had told the techs that the Velcro that was holding the secret compartment that had uh, a recorder in it, it's a Nagra recorder used a lot in the movie industry. It's a heavy recorder. And um, I said, you know, the Velcro is letting go sometimes. We need to get that fixed. Oh, yeah, we got it fixed. You can use that mm -hmm. briefcase again. Okay, so I opened my briefcase and sure enough, the Nagra falls out of the secret compartment oh, into the man. briefcase with a nest of wires. And this guy's on the other side of the briefcase and I'm trying to put this thing together without looking like I'm putting <laughs> something together. And right. he get, he begins to get impatient. Just as I get it back together, he stands up and comes around to get the records. It was oh my God. two seconds. I had maybe two seconds I got it done two seconds before he came around the, uh, to the to the other side. So, yeah, unfortunately, and you got to be calm. Like you're like a kid whose mom walks in when he's looking at Playboy magazine, and you're just like, I need to shove this under my bed as fast as I can without looking like I'm shoving this under my bed as fast as I can. It's crazy. <laughs> oh my god. Ah. Oh. You meanwhile, you're like clenching up every sphincter in your body because you're like, this guy's going to kill me. And you're like, but I'm just let me just shuffle in my papers. And he comes mm. up like, all right, let's see it. Oh, my God. Well, I knew that I couldn't, you know, the biggest um, they, these people have a sixth sense and they can pick up um, on fear. And so I knew that if I outwardly showed fear and if I outwardly showed nervousness, I would become my own worst enemy. And so that's why I had to have the two brains operating. And, you know, I would be getting virtually coached by myself <laughs> about, you know, no shit, you better not do that. Um, yeah, got to handle it this way. And, um, and, and so you've got to keep both those brains uh, actively moving. There was another close call that I read in the book that I thought was uh, interesting. And also I was a little confused. You mentioned that you were in a hotel and you're in a meeting with guys who are already suspicious a little bit. And this guy walks by and is like, hey, Bob. And it's some guy that you had already busted before. Am I getting that right? Because I don't understand how you got through that one in one piece. Yeah, it's a, it, it's a little different. Here's the okay. thing. I'm with Roberto El Caino. He has his bodyguard who's armed outside in the car waiting for us. And um, we're waiting for the female agent to come down. And... And so we're in the lobby. It was, mm -hmm. I think it was the Helmsley Palace. And yes, I had done previously one prior, I would call it a midterm, uh, mid-level uh, UC operation. It lasted six months. It would be a thing where for a week or 10 days, I would be undercover and then I'd be back out and, you know, back in my office for a week or two weeks. And, mm -hmm. you know, it was in and out kind of thing. Yeah. And it was a group. Um, a Thai marijuana and Colombian marijuana group, huge, one of the biggest in the in the United States, uh, run by a guy by the name of Bruce Perlow and P-E-R-L-O-W-I-N. People should look him up. What a story. And um, he uh, had an accountant and an attorney who were laundering for him. I had infiltrated the accountant and the attorney, and I became the main witness uh, against them. They pled guilty. The accountant, his name is Charlie, uh, he decided to cooperate, and I even testified on his behalf at his sentencing. He got a, a very favorable sentence of like only five years. So while in prison, um, he happens to be in the same prison with one of the Watergate guys, Chuck Colson, <laughs> who wrote a book about being born again. And so Charlie became born again. I hadn't seen him in eight years plus. And we're in the Helmsley Palace. 
And I'm there standing next to Roberto. And I hear from the other side of the lobby, Bob. And I look over and it's Charlie Brune. And he's walking fast toward me. So I turn to Roberto and I go, oh, Roberto, an old friend. Wait here. I'll be right back. So now I'm walking over to Charlie as he's coming to me. Little did I know until a few seconds later, Roberto was shadowing me. So I get to Charlie and I hug him and I whispered in his ear, Charlie, I'm under, play along. And I step back. I literally felt a bead of sweat go right down the middle of my back. I bet. <laughs> yeah. And Charlie, who had a lot of Las Vegas connections, that's what... We put him away because he was laundering through a casino out there. And, and I, I wound up be becoming the courier, taking the money to the casino. And um, he, Charlie, goes, uh, Bob, man, you're working too hard. The boys in Vegas haven't seen you in a long time. Why don't you come out? I'll get you comped, you know, and blah, 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 blah. And, and he just plays along the whole thing. And, um, and so the next morning I met with him. And he actually wound up helping us in this case later. But... Roberto never heard um, Charlie uh, say anything about the re the real truth about the relationship between uh, me and him. Luckily, that is such a so he played along because he's like a man of God now. Because it seems like he could have yeah. been like this guy, but put me in jail, and then you're just dead. That's it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I you know I I remember a scene from um, uh, Joe Pistone's movie uh, Donnie Brasco where a prosecutor was coming up an escalator. And the guy, he was with bad guys, and the guy went, came right up to him. And in that case, at least according to the film, Pistone knocked him out. That would have been my next move that I would have had to have done with Charlie. Um, and, and when Pistone did that, he said, oh, that guy grabbed me. He's, you know, he's uh, coming after me or blah, 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 blah. Uh -huh. And so that explained why he knocked the guy out. Everybody left and then they moved on. So, yeah, if Charlie hadn't played along, I would have had to do something to shut him up. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I, mean, I bet you're glad you didn't have to do that. That, that could have just gone so poorly. How, how long does it take to launder a hundred million dollars? Your cut is 15%. Is that how it usually works? Or is it five? No. Um, it's going to vary based upon how high up the food chain you are dealing uh, closest to the owner. The okay. owner is going to expect to lose. At that time frame, the owner is going to expect to lose about 15% okay. of the value of the money. But, you know, I always tell people there are as many different methods of laundering as there are uh, different uh, forms of snowflakes. I mean, it's indefinite, uh, infinite, an infinite number of, of different ways. In this particular case, we were dealing uh, money through the black money market. So when you're a black money market operator, as I was, you have um, supply and demand clients. Uh, I went to college uh, in New York and my economics 101 professor, the only thing I ever remembered from economics was supply and demand. Keep it equal. You'll have lots of profit. You're not going to have clients that you're not able to get your supplies to, and you won't have excess supplies sitting there when you don't have enough clients. So... We had supply clients of money, dollars, and these are drug traffickers. Mm -hmm. So they've got all of this and they want to get something else. So now I need to find demand clients that possess what the supply clients want. And a portion of this money, they wanted to get Colombian pesos. So now I've got to find people who possess Colombian pesos and want dollars. Well, Anybody who's been operating in the black money markets know that the best place to go for that is importers, importers within the country where your supply client wants to get whatever it is. It could be Mexican pesos, Colombian pesos. Um, it depends on who you're dealing with. But the bottom line is now I've got importers who want dollars. If they wanted at that time to get dollars, they had to go through the official cha channels and they had to prepay like 25% in taxes, duties. So if they've got $100, they're only going to get $75 worth of dollars. If they've got 
$100 worth of pesos and they want to get dollars, they're going to give up 25%. So right. now they're going to have 75 bucks. Well, you come to me in the black money market, I'll sell it to you for 10%. So in theory, bottom line, the supply client is willing to give up 15%. The demand client who wants to get what the supply client's got is willing to pay you 10% to get the dollars. I arrange a swap. So on a million dollar swap, I'm making 15% on one side, 10% on the other. Oh, it's wow. a quarter of a million bucks. Um, that's why black money markets operate throughout the world so aggressively wow. um, in order to get around official channels. Anytime a government creates capital restriction, that back then that was a capital restriction based upon importers. Now China yeah. becomes a major player because they have a capital restriction, can't invest more than $50,000 worth outside the borders of the People's Republic of China in a year. But they want to go to the black market. They're going to buy tens of, of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars in order to do it. And people who run the black money markets know geographically where it is that they can get the clientele that they need on both sides. I did an episode about this. It, it, there's cr the money launder or the, the capital flight from China. It's crazy. They'll they'll drop off fifty million dollars to somebody in China who basically calls like a laundromat or dry cleaner in Vancouver, and then that person's laying out. They, and they, I've seen the photos of the bus. They're laying out duffel bags full of cash locally, so no money has to actually cross the border. It's just like a sort of weird banking system that they can do. And then they'll use it to buy like three houses in Vancouver or something like that to park their cash. It's really yeah, and there, amazing. There are a couple of reasons beyond just that capital restriction. First of all, um, there are massive free trade zones in China. And so a lot of times these traffickers want to get goods. Um, it's called trade-based money laundering. So if they can exchange lockers full of cash and they can get container loads full of refrigerators that's a deal because they can bring them those back to columbia they can sell them they can say hey i got a legitimate business i got this appliance store and blah 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 blah, blah. so there's free trade zones but most importantly especially in um a, an area a town called guangzhou they are experts in creating counterfeit goods so now, not only can you get goods, but you can get counterfeit goods. And if you're a bad guy, um, in the there was a case called the Guangzhou Enterprise case, five billion dollars in wow. counterfeit goods brought into Latin America. You know how many legitimate businessmen were knocked out of business because of of their counterfeit goods. But then there's also um, unregulated pharmaceutical companies in China. They are selling precursors for methamphetamine, mm -hmm. they're selling fentanyl. If I can give the Chinese $10 million in Vancouver and they can make arrangements for me to get a shipment of methamphetamine precursors, I'm doing great. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that's another reason for, uh, for China to become so involved. But they're also, it's impossible for you to serve a subpoena on an institution in China. Right. The People's Republic of, of China is not going to honor due process from the U.S. courts. So you got another layer. So, I mean, there's a ton of different reasons why China has become the gorilla in the money laundering world. Can we do like a brief trace of the path of money from a drug buyer on the street and then through the money laundering process? Like what, so user buys a baggie on the corner, then what? I mean, they got to aggregate this. You're not laundering 50 bucks at a time, right? No, no. I, I get into the process when the courier that is responsible to the cartel has a, a, a responsible, a, a reasonable amount to be turned over. Uh, normally, we would get a eh, quarter of a million, half a million at a time. Um, that's done through codes. The uh, money broker in Medellin, who was a real bad guy that I dealt with, who had the import export company. Um, the representative of the cartel leader would come to him and go, okay, we've got uh, $2 million in Detroit. 
and here's the here's the cell phone number, and um, the the code is that uh, it's uh, the money is for Pacho to be paid to Isabella, and so now that gets passed to my partner, mm -hmm. and then my partner or one of the undercover agents that's working in given cities would go pick it up. Now my partner at times would use our uh, jet our private jet and from the from the jet company so I'll, I'll use that one as an example he would go to houston and he'd he'd be before he left he would be on the phone he'd talk to that phone number talk to the person they would confirm codes and then they would work out where it was that they were going to meet in order to pass the money on most often they want and we want to meet in a public place a mcdonald's so you show up at the McDonald's, the guy's inside, and uh, they in, my, my partner goes over, the guy says little, if anything, <laughs> and shoves keys over to my partner and says, the white Chevy out there, and usually it's a beat up, ratty looking old car. Mm -hmm. It's in the trunk. Because they're gonna get rid so, of the car, right? <laughs> yeah. Single so use. now, yeah, now, um, my partner takes the car, making sure he's not followed. Of course, if if they've put anything on there in order to, um, you know, follow the car, a monitor of some sort, um, that's a problem. <laughs> so, you know, um, we weren't too crazy about taking their cars because we don't know whether or not they're wired up. But anyway, just in this example, I can tell you that, okay, so he goes to another location. They offload the two million. They bring back the car. He meets the guy, gives the guy his keys. We've now got the money. Now I try. I talk them into. I would only pay. Um. They want all the money right away, and I said to him, "Okay, listen. I got the government to give me five million dollars in recoverable funds, and my." position to my superiors was if we're picking up a million dollars I think we could quickly tell whether or not there's at least 750,000 there mm -hmm. uh, they're usually bound in rubber bands in blocks of five uh, or ten and twenty thousand dollars so I paid within 24 hours 75 percent of what we picked up and about eight days later they'd get the rest that would come in through a wire transfer after we were able to count, verify, and and do all the, the other stuff that we needed to do. The reason I wanted to tell you the story on the private jet and my, my partner picking it up is, so my partner's out there and he picks up two million bucks. He comes back to the air charter service and I had given him a credit card to pay for the gas. He had outspent the limit. So he's there with the fixed base operator who says, dude, you owe me 2,500 bucks. And he goes, okay, wait a minute. Puts one of the suitcases down, unzips it. It's a suitcase full of cash. He takes out 2,500, counts it out of one of the bundles and gives it to the guy. And then he gets on the plane. So you would think that the guy who runs the fixed base operation is going to pick up the phone and call the cops yeah. and say, you're not going to believe what just happened. Yeah, That did not happen. The next time my partner comes back on the jet to the same fixed base operator, they rolled out a red carpet. They brought him a, a tray of fruit and <laughs> champagne, and they did everything they could to cater to him. Um, that's American greed. I'm sorry, but that, that's unfortunately uh, how that went down. That, that's that's insane, right? Yeah. Hey, should we do something about this? Yes, we absolutely should do something about this. Go to the store and get some Dom Perignon and put it on ice for when this guy gets back. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we should do about this. There's more where that came from. And double his fuel bill. He's not going to bat an eye. Do you see how much cash that guy brought on that plane? That's <laughs> Man, I, yeah. how do you, when you're... You're laundering this amount of money. It sounds like you're doing what, like a million bucks a week, but you could probably do more than that, right? Like, I guess I go going back to my earlier question: How long would it take to launder a hundred million dollars, for example? Okay. Well, first of all, we're not going to want to do that. You're going to have to realize that there 
by laundering money, we're facilitating mm-hmm. their criminal organization. Right. And our, our position always was, if we're laundering for the same people and we're not getting any new information, new intelligence yeah. with respect to what they're up to, we need to find a way not to pick up money from them anymore. Mm. You know, it could be, hey, they're sloppy. Um, we don't want to deal with them. Uh, we, we thought we saw eyes, you name it. Now, unfortunately, <clears throat> getting back to that machismo law enforcement angle, a lot of cops go like, hey, we had this really big money laundering case. We laundered $400 million. Um, Banco shares was one of the first major FBI money laundering stings, and they did launder about $400 million. In this operation, the first one that we're talking about that the infiltrator film was made on, it may not sound like a lot. We only laundered $32 million. The, the name of the game is launder the minimum amount you can and get the maximum amount of information that you can, because otherwise you're just helping them. And right, okay. make sure you've got a plan to get them arrested and not have to worry about them being in a country where they can't be extradited. And because there have been prior cases where that unfortunately has been the case, where sure. the major bad, bad guys, um, they couldn't get collared. So really, you have a pretty piece of paper. You've laundered a lot of money. To me, that's not a big case. To me, uh, that's a travesty. Right, right. Because then you, all you've done is supply them with tons of money to continue criminal operations and corruption around the globe, but you didn't really get anything in return. So you're, yep. you're basically, all you did is help criminals at that point by working for for free or for yeah. for yeah for free. For your fees. Yeah, for your yeah, fees. Yeah, for your fees. How do you learn money laundering in the first place? Not like for people who are listening that want to learn how to launder money, to be clear. How do you <laughs> particularly learn money laundering? Because I know you've got a degree in business administration, but I'm guessing that money laundering is not a course at most universities. So does the law enforcement, does the DEA or customs or whatever be like, okay, here's how money laundering works. You kind of get a crash course in that and then you're like, all right, I'm a money launderer undercover. Well, there's training in that uh, area, you know, in basic training, your uh, intermediate training. Um, there's advanced training in money laundering. Um, but I have to say that I learned tenfold about money laundering from real bad guys. Yeah. Um, more so than I did from people who were involved in law enforcement. Uh, it's amazing to me the unfortunate, sad truth. And that is that the United Nations on Drugs and Crime estimates that roughly $400 billion a year is generated from the sale of illegal drugs. Wow. On its best day ever, the Department of Justice can only take credit for probably less than, but let's say a billion dollars in bad guy money. Now, you got to watch how they cook the books because when a bank pays a $19 billion fine, they consider that to be, they, they structure that as a forfeiture and it makes the numbers look so much better. I'm talking about real bad guy money. So if they're only getting a billion and 400 billion is made, do the math, one fourth of 1%. Yeah. We're not even scratching their coffers not even coming close. And what we sometimes don't recognize is nations are involved in this. Sure. When, when I was undercover in the infiltrator case, now we haven't talked much about the other side of the case, which is by infiltration of the bank of credit and commerce international, but I was at a social gathering. Um, I was one of the other social clubs I belonged to was Renee's. Um, and they, Renee's had, locations in every major city and it was like where all the beautiful people went back during that time frame and so i'm at renee's in miami and um with this guy and he goes to me you know who the biggest money launderer in the united states is and i'm the eager agent Uh, you know i've got my my sickness my heroin i'm going to get more information you know this is going to be fantastic and he goes well, it's the Federal Reserve, of course. And I said, what? He goes, Bob, how naive are you? This is all hypocrisy. Here's the bottom line. 
at the bank, and this was true at the time of the conversation and continued on for a few years after that. At the Bank of the Republic in Colombia, there is an arrangement called the sinister window. Some called it the anonymous window. Your, your listeners can just Google sinister window Colombia. They'll read the whole story. So if you had the right connections in Colombia, you could go to the Bank of the Republic with all the cash you had, and you would get a very quick exchange into Colombian pesos, and uh, it would happen fast. And then the central bank would get the dollars. Now, why was that happening? Well, because at that time, the inflation rate per year in Colombia was 28%. So if you held your assets in pesos at the end of the year, no matter what you put in your mattress, it was worth 28% less than it was before. So the central bank doesn't want to be holding all those Colombian pesos, but oh, guess what? It's illegal at that time for any Colombian to have a U.S. dollar account, period. Totally illegal. Well, so now, as the banker said to me, well, what do you think the Bank of the Republic does with those dollars after they get them from these anonymous people? They put it on pallets, they shrink wrap it, and they send it to the Federal Reserve. They fly it in. And then what happens? It is counted and it's put because every central bank and many other banks, major, major banks, they are members. I mean, they, they've got their accounts with the Federal Reserve. So they want to get that money into their U.S. dollar bank balance. Wow. They don't want to hold it in currency. So now he goes to me, don't you think that there's somebody with enough brains at the Federal Reserve when these pallets of hundreds of millions of dollars of U.S. dollars are coming in from Colombia, where it's illegal for anybody to have a dollar account. Where the heck do you think they got? Obviously, they know where this money's coming from. He said, you know, it's all a joke, Bob. And that was, uh, it was quite an eye opener for me. Yeah, I can man, I can only imagine. I just Googled Renee's social club. I don't think it exists anymore. Is that no possible? No, it does not. What happens if you lose money that you're supposed to launder or move for the cartel? Because the obvious answer is, oh, they just kill you. But what if it's not your fault? I mean, do they care at all? Because, look, yes, these are like heartless sociopaths that lack compassion, but they still theoretically want to find out where the real problem is in their business and organization as opposed to just like killing the last guy who touched the money. Or am I giving them too much credit? No, you're spot on. It was extraordinarily important for the cartel to demand from whoever had the money last for them to get documents that proved that, in fact, the money had been lawfully seized, that there was a seizure warrant, maybe there was an affidavit, and they wanted to look at the affidavit for the search warrant, if it was public, most times it was, to be able to see who's responsible. They would immediately say to anybody who was likely to be responsible, get your butt down here to Columbia and answer questions. Now, federal agents at that time, despite the fact that I begged to be able to go, were not allowed to go to Columbia. It wasn't until the second undercover operation by then that I was able to do that. Um, I This infiltrator story, the undercover operation, started about 18 months after Enrique Kiki Camarena, the DEA agent, was uh, kidnapped, tortured, and murdered. And uh, Colombia and Mexico were off limits for being able to do that. And, and the Colombian traffickers knew that, which is why they kept inviting you to come there. Because they know, oh, he, he's not going to come. He can't come. Why? Because he's a DEA agent. Uh -huh. That's why he's not going to come. Um, yeah, so they want to get that. Now, if you can prove that it was not your fault, but you were in the mix, you would be expected to participate in paying back. Sometimes what they would allow you to do would be work for free. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get your cut, and you're going to continue to do this, 
until your portion of this is repaid. And if you didn't do that, like one of the Colombian uh, money launderers that I dealt with, he had um, horses. He was a big horse fan into the um, bottom line is they were expensive horses. And what they did is first, they, what they did is they poisoned his horse, one of his horses, his favorite horse. And then they came, they took all of his furniture out. They came and they forced him to sign documents to turn over all of his properties. Uh, and they told him, you better find a way to pay the rest of this or you're dead. So, I mean, it depends upon how deep um, your responsibility is for what it is that occurred. Man, yeah, it's it seems like, I mean, obviously you take the work, work it off thing rather than the getting killed thing. I assume you cannot just throw other criminals under the bus. That's probably not allowed since you know that those people are likely to get killed if you do that. I mean, I'm guessing that's against policy slash the law. Yeah, well, closest we came to that, um, we had a seizure, if, if you read The Betrayal, the second book, mm -hmm. in Houston. And the money was actually, <laughs> we went there for the purposes of picking it up. The DEA agent who was there was supposed to have gotten in touch with, you would call it a clearinghouse, where law enforcement tells each other on the day of or a day before what they're going to be doing because we don't want to have cops arresting cops. And, and so he didn't go through the clearinghouse and our guy shows up to pick up the money and they're, they're ahead of us and they're going to seize $4 million that's sitting inside the house. And now, but our guy's there and wow. we're going to be suspected undoubtedly. And it really wasn't our fault, but it sure did appear to be our fault. And we wound up getting authorization to turn over a report as though we had somebody on the inside uh, that threw blame in another direction. Um, I don't, I'm not sure that they actually bought it, mm -hmm. but um, we had to do something in, in order to be able to get out of it. And actually the real truth of it is the place was under surveillance because they had been for years investigating the person mm -hmm. who was involved in that operation. So, um, we shared some of the truth. Um, and unfortunately, uh, it's, it really did rattle the undercover agent. That's the guy who ultimately wound up compromising me and, uh, and going mm -hmm. to prison for 11 years, but he was scared to death. Uh, after that it happened because they they thought that he was either an informant or or a cop uh one or the other so i think the smarter thing would have been been to come back and go you know uh you gotta have a scenario where they think i died because i i just i'm not going to do this anymore but he didn't unfortunately take that uh route you wrote in 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 one of your books that money laundering enables cartels to produce their most lethal product which is corruption and I thought it was interesting because my reading of that was that you think the corruption is worse than the drugs. Is that accurate? Absolutely. Um, I can give you an example. Um, well, during my time, I'm sitting around with the guys, you know, high up in the cartel. And somehow or another, the, the subject of Manuel Noriega, the ruler of Panama at the time, came up. And, you know, it was very clear. Uh, don't worry about any of your accounts getting tagged by the government. He's on our side. We pay him. We move drugs through there. And uh, he, he has his people turn the other way. And um, he's, we own him. So that became a, math, a method by which the cartel was able to facilitate massive, massive amounts of movements of, of Ill illegal drugs. You can fast forward until, you know, till just a year or so ago, there's a case I wrote, I've written articles about it and all the articles that I've written are on my website under publications. Um, there was a, a DEA case where DEA had determined that there was this very mysterious person always referred to by the traffickers as El Patron, the godfather, 
who was providing information about what was going on um, within law enforcement, uh, helping them to avoid seizures, um, helping them to basically beat anything that law enforcement was trying to do. Eventually, DEA identified who uh, El Padron was, and he was actually General Salvador Sinfuegos Zapata, who was the Minister of Defense for all of Mexico from 2012 to 2018. Wow. They, they arrested him and they held him. Uh, no bond. This was near the tail end of the uh, Trump administration. And the president, still same president of Mexico, was outraged. You, you have undermined the sovereignty of our nation. We will conduct our own investigation. You need to give him back to us. Uh, he will pay, pr pay the price here. And um, it became a big political problem. And Attorney General Barr decided that, okay, we're going to give him back. It took the Mexicans 30 days. Somehow, in 30 days, they were able to go through thousands of of uh, text messages and wire, uh, um, wire intercepts. And they, they determined in 30 days that General Sinfuegos was completely innocent. He never did anything wrong. As a matter of fact, this year, I think it was this year, he received you know, one of the highest awards from uh, the president of Mexico for his tremendous service to Mexico. Um, we, we've now convicted this year in February, the former, recently former president of Honduras, Juan Orlando Hernandez. I saw that. Who was yeah. in the pocket. He was in the pocket of the, of the cartel. His brother is doing life in prison. He's yet to be sentenced. Um, there's a room full of senators from Honduras. Uh, they owned Honduras. The, the Honduran government, anybody who tried to stand up to them, and to try to do anything about this, wound up getting whacked by their leaders. Um, they had a general who's pled guilty, or the head of their, uh, excuse me, their narcotics, uh, their mil military. Um, he's pled guilty. He's facing life in prison. He was going to testify against uh, Juan Orlando Hernandez in the February trial of this year. Um, they owned Honduras, and they could do anything there that they wanted, and the rule of law was stolen from the people of Honduras. And you know, I'm, I'm, I just don't think that the average American recognizes that how many journalists, how many, uh, you know, hey, it could be podcasters who are trying to get the free word out there who uh, wind up missing and and yeah. become part of the missing. So uh, it's happening in many of these countries. We have journalists who, who listen to the show that run accounts and things like that under basically like pseudonyms, right? So they'll release a story online and they they publish things online under fake names. And I, I, I've read this stuff and I remember mentioning it once on a show and I got a DM from them and they're like, I heard you mention me on the show. I listen to your podcast. So some of these very same people who are outing narcos and things like that in Mexico or other countries and writing the real news uh, who are living in fear, they're listening to this right now. I mean, it's a thing that it's, it's terrifying. The, these people can't do anything in public because half their colleagues are dead or more, or, or at least just not no longer writing about anything narco related is too dangerous, which is yeah, you know, insane. It's, it's amazing to think that the Honduran, the people who were in charge of the Honduran government, operated clandestine cocaine labs in Colombia and Honduras, provided uh, a gateway for hundreds of tons of cocaine to the U.S. and Canada, bribed, put millions of dollars in political figures, killed hundreds of people involved in human rights defenders, environmental defenders, uh, competing traffickers, they conspired with corrupt senior military and law enforcement leaders. They sold military-grade weapons to the cartels. And they provided military escorts for caravans of, of drugs. And, and this was going on just under the, the, under the nose of um, all of us. 
and it has been and continues to and will continue to that it's it's not going to stop what made you finally get out of the undercover game um when it became very clear to me that in the second operation the one i uh, wrote the book the betrayal about that i came within 3 minutes of being murdered um, after the operation was over, I didn't pull out then, but after the operation was over, it was uh, clear to me that the, the price that my family was paying, um, was not worth my continuing. And it was time for some young, young up and comings, uh, to pick up the baton. Are you still worried at all about these guys coming after you? I should probably mention for the listeners that your face is darkened here so we can't see it. Uh, I assume that that's because there's an active threat or at least the the, the shadow of the threat. Uh, you know, you're concerned enough to, to take precautions. Yeah, you know, in today's world where it's so easy for people to communicate with you uh, via the Internet, um, and at times, especially when the film came out, that would have been in 2016. Um, there were threats that came in, you know, I expected it from drug traffickers, but there were, uh, there are also people who are of the belief, and this is not true, but they are of the belief that the Bank of Credit and Commerce International, BCCI, which was not just the seventh largest privately held bank in the world, but the largest Arab bank in the world, which was on the way to becoming a major player in the Western banking world. Some people from Pakistan um, believe that a combination of the Western bank banks, you know, the city banks and, uh, of the world and the CIA um, were the orchestrators of what became the prosecution of the Bank of Credit and Commerce International because they didn't want to see the Arab world become the major financial player that BCCI was most certainly going to become. They had, uh, I think, 1,200 branches. I th they were in seven, 72 countries. Um, they were massive. It's, man, I, I always, I always wonder, do you ever, well, I read your resume and it's case after case of 10 million seized, yachts seized, hotels seized, shares in this company seized, 20 million in assets, $100 million in product. Those kinds of numbers are going to sting a little if you're on the other end of that. So I, I'm guessing at, at some point they're, they're, there's probably a contract out on you, at least after the first couple of years, or are they kind of like, what's done is done. We're not going after a cop. Um, Within 30 days after the end of um, the infiltrator story, the undercover portion of it, within 30 days, uh, two law enforcement agencies and a, an intelligence agency reported that there was a half million dollar contract on my life. Um, you got to take that serious. <laughs> uh, I was a very, very important witness. And among the defendants charged that we were going to try to get our hands on, and we never did, was Pablo Escobar's most important lawyer. Um, there was also Pablo Escobar's right-hand man, the manager of 60% of his operations, who ultimately Pablo tortured and killed, had him tortured and killed. Um, and so, you know, I don't think, that, you know, that as far as product goes, that doesn't really bother them. Um, <clears throat> when I was in the game, um, it cost about 250 bucks to make a kilo of Coke. And it cost maybe $2,500 prorated uh, to transport that kilo to the United States. So a $3,000 investment. Most of the transportation was done by giving a portion of the load to the transporter. Mm. So if the load got seized... They lost right, $500 pay. a kilo right? and that's it. So, Hey, no big deal. They've got, they've got loads coming constantly in semi submersible submarines in containers and you name it, you know, and, and it, 
it kind of bothers me that a lot of people have this suspicion that people who run across the border and jump over a fence are, you know, the way that we're getting fentanyl into this country. You know, there, I think there were 62,000 pounds seized in LA. That's a lot of backpacks. Mm -hmm. um, and that's enough <laughs> yeah. to get everybody on the planet high twice. So, um, no, it's, these are very sophisticated. They have what they call pipelines. And, you know, Roberto gave me his entire pipeline. Um, it was pretty simple. Uh, a lab in Bolivia producing about 6,000 kilograms. I got to look back whether that was a month or a week, but I, maybe it was a month. But anyway, 6,000 kilograms. They had a remote airstrip there. So small planes would come in. They'd uh, fly out like 500, 600 kilos at a time. Land in uh, the north of, north of Argentina. They would take it in vans to Buenos Aires, where he had uh, a seafood packing plant. It would get packed. If you had a 40,000 uh, pound shipment of anchovies in commercial cans, there might be 2,000, 3,000 pounds of Coke in some of the commercially uh, sealed cans. They were very, very sophisticated. They would have electric scales for the real can, which was 23 pounds. They'd have an open can with the lid on the other electric can, uh, the electric uh, scale. They would put in half kilo bricks of Coke, lead ingots, sand, get it exactly the same, mm -hmm. seal it commercially, and then pack it. There was a very uh, low-key secret way. The name of the company was Dipez. So the dot in the eye of the box that had two 23-pound cans, the eye had a pinhole in the dot of the eye. Oh, my God. So that they knew that that was the box that needed to be pulled. That's how they operate. They operate with very sophisticated... And they buy companies that have operated for five, ten years in a very legitimate way. And then they take it over because they want a company that has a track record. They know we can't possibly screen all the containers that come across our border. It's impossible. Man, the methods now must be even more. And now they're probably using like RFID. And when the barcode number ends in an odd number and then another odd number, it's like, what, I mean, there's just unlimited ways you can do this kind of thing with digital with the whole digital footprint stuff and the way the shipping works now, it's just absolutely nuts. H how much money is laundered globally, do you think? Well, according to the United Nations on Drugs and Crime, that number, now, it comes from many different sources. Not just drug trafficking, illegal arms dealing, um, pilfering treasuries, uh, which is a sport in African nations. Um, white collar crime, uh, hacking, all that. They estimate that to be roughly $2 trillion a year. Oof. <laughs> that's a lot. That's somehow way more than I thought, but I guess it all adds up fast. Mm -hmm. Wow. And what percentage is, is, has to do with the United States? I guess that's probably really hard to break out by country, right? With the, the human trafficking drugs and arms in the United States is... Uh, is that something well, the UN, you happen to know? UND, the UNDOC, United Nations on Drugs and Crime, uh, periodically puts out um, the information that they get from all of the member, country members. Mm -hmm. And so those numbers are out there. I don't remember them off the top of my head, but, you know, the U.S. by far has the most insatiable appetite in the world for illegal drugs. Europe has become, you know, Europe was a, f was a funny thing when, when back in the day when I was there doing it with Roberto Elcano and Pablo Escobar and those people, um, you could actually get, and it's still not quite this big, but it is uh, something similar. You could get three times the amount of money for a kilo of Coke as you could in Europe as you could in the United States. So it was very, very lucrative business in that area. But you weren't seeing huge seizures. Now, 6,000 kilos, yeah. 8,000 kilos. You know, now the nations of Africa, mostly West Africa, but most, a lot of the African nations have become corrupted. 
uh, and have become the transshipment point for the drugs that go up into Europe. And so a lot of the money and a lot of the drugs is exchanged uh, in those areas. Uh, countries like Guinea-Bissau, um, uh, Mali, Ghana, um, many of them, Senegal, a lot of these nations are completely riddled with uh, drug trafficking. And another thing that a lot of people don't realize is the most common currency that's dealt in African nations is the U.S. dollar. And so it's their currency. They've got, they've got a place to be able to place it. They can use it. I know that uh, Europeans co uh, Europe's co cocaine market has eclipsed that of the United States, if you're just talking about cocaine. I'm, I'm pretty sure, like you said, illegal drugs in total. We're talking about fentanyl, heroin, uh, illegal marijuana. I think it all adds up in, uh, towards the U.S. But for cocaine itself, Europe has finally eclipsed the United States in consumption of cocaine, which and I, which I heard from somebody who covers the crime beat in Europe, cocaine specifically, which that surprised me, actually. Mm. But, but if you go should. nation by nation, we're still hands, you know, oh, yeah. head and shoulders. I mean, you got to take the whole continent of Europe and add right. it up to, hit the United, <laughs> to, to, get to, the, to beat the U.S. and how much stuff they put up their nose. Yeah, for sure. Oh, man. So I know we're running out of time. I'm so curious. It seems like the deeper you get into this world, the better credibility you have, right? You're hanging out with drug traffickers, money, uh, doing the money laundering thing. There's spies, there's corrupt bankers, corrupt politicians. And the whole time you are essentially acting as if you're one of them, right? That's the job. So I wonder, did any of their characteristics ever seep into the real you? It just seems like it would be very, very hard to be around people like that. 24 7 ish and then go back home and you put on your dad shoes and you got to be this normal guy instead of a normal guy with like 10 percent criminal scumbag dna sprinkled on your personality hmm well <clears throat> you're the undercover agent's probably the last one to to recognize that but i i guess i've got to say that in some senses um there must be some truth to that because I remember <clears throat> I was away for like a month or so and came back and I was spending a couple of days uh, at home. And my brother-in-law and sister-in-law uh, from Connecticut had come down to spend time with me and my wife. And I remember I was getting the bags, their bags out of the car and bringing them back in. And I overheard my sister-in-law go, he's starting to look like them. Oh, He's starting to like even act like them. Um, I didn't, you know, you got to realize too that my shtick was being aligned with an Italian American mob family. Right. And, you know, I grew up in a community where that was very prevalent. And I worked a lot of organized crime cases when I was in law enforcement. So I knew how those people act and carry themselves. And, and so that was part of my cover. Um, but like I've said before, a good undercover agent uh, isn't going to put themselves in a position where they become an actor. You've got to use parts of your real experiences in life. Now, it doesn't sound like it when you hear me now no. that I'm from Staten Island, but I can tell you why that happened. And that's when I started my college career, I went to Carbondale, Southern Illinois University. Illinois, people don't have an accent. Mm. And I started talking to people about, hey, how are you guys doing? <laughs> and, and they're going, you guys, what are you talking about? So now the peer pressure of this guy talks like an idiot um, started to, to really cause me to watch how I spoke. Um, and so I dropped a lot of it, but promise you one ride on the Staten Island ferry and I'm back to saying, forget about it and all that other stuff. And it, it's natural. It's a part of me. And that's what I'm saying is, you know, it's, it's who I am. It's, it, I mean, as far as being a person who speaks like they're from New York and, and, and speaks and sounds like, and thinks like people who live in that other world. Well, you've certainly had an interesting career, and I mean, it's it's still cranking along. You're just uh, 
maybe less likely to get killed in what you're doing now. I, I guess you can say you never got bored. At least you got that going for you. Yeah, that's true. Um, you know, and I wrote an article that's going to be in the uh, Tampa Bay Times this Sunday talking about uh, threats. Uh, and and I started the article by saying that, you know, I, from a very reliable source, I found out that um, I was being hunted again. And that I, I got that information just a year ago. But it came from my urologist um, because... <laughs> He identified the fact that I have cancer and uh, I've been through treatment and all signs are extraordinarily good. And I wrote this article basically to say, you know, as a patient and a friend, if you run into this, I've done so much research on this. I, I approached it every way, the same way that I would doing an undercover operation. I even went to three cancer centers and I interviewed the radiation oncologists and their teams before I ultimately decided that the right place for me to go is MD Anderson. And so that's where I went in Houston. And, um, and so, yeah, I'm still facing death, but it's, it's, it's in, a, in the same way that we all are. Um, and I really do hope that people who read that article take me up on reaching out and giving me the opportunity to be a tiny little piece of, of sharing with them the research that I did and, and, um, and hopefully make that journey for them a little bit easier because there's unfortunately a lot of people who who face that. Bob Mazur, thank you very much. I'm you got to come back at some point because you're doing so much. This has been super interesting, and you've been very generous with your time. I really, really appreciate it. Oh well, it's my my pleasure, Jordan. I appreciate it. I appreciate being on your show and getting a chance to talk to your your listeners. And um, um, what you know. There are a lot of people, and this is an important thing for them to know, there are countless people who are public servants who are trying to do the right thing for them. Hey, I'm no superstar, and I'm no different than the greatest majority of the people that I met in that walk of life. And um, they have some good things to think, of, to, to, to think about because um, there are a lot of people out there fighting for them every single day. Thank you for checking out this entire episode on YouTube. If you want to follow up on this topic, check out our podcast feed or visit us on our website at jordanharbinger.com where you can learn more about our guest and dive even deeper into what we discussed today. And remember, YouTube is not the only place that you can check out the Jordan Harbinger Show. Any podcast app should have us. Check out the links in the description where you will find access to our shows that don't appear on YouTube, like Skeptical Sunday, where we debunk topics like crystal healing, GMOs, conspiracy theories, homeopathy, tipping, even lawns. To find out if they're back by science and logic, or if they're just complete nonsense. Spoiler, many of them are complete nonsense. Also, our Feedback Friday shows where we help people escape from cults, get raises at work, and take all manner of questions from you, the audience, all the way down to the bottom of the barrel. And every episode of The Jordan Harbinger Show has something useful you can take away and apply in your own life and help you navigate what I know can often seem like the overwhelming and paralyzing challenges of modern life. Life can be hard, yes, but we are here to help. And if you appreciate how we help, remember to like, comment, and subscribe.